Hey guys, how are you? It's kind of weird. I look super young, don't I? Right? Therefore, I'll only speak kind words to you. All right. What's going on, guys? How come I look so young? I look so young. Anyway, I'm going to pray and then we're going to call this gentleman. But just to let you know what's going on. Some gentleman contacted me on my Facebook page saying that Jesus is God the Father. And I said, you need to repent of your heresy, so I'm going to call you, and you're going to defend your position. And he said, sure. And when I talked to him, he's very giddy, very happy. In fact, I, I sense, to be honest with you, this is just me, it's, he's not normal. The way I'm talking about him, he was kind of too giddy, too happy, like, oh, yeah, he. So if by some <clears throat> reason he starts manifesting that he's not completely normal, I'll just shut down and I will discuss what I wanted to discuss last night. But Satan attacked and distracted. But I need to pray because we need the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit to intervene, intercede, and preserve us. I really need the triune God. I really need God in my life. And I say this because all of you agree, and I'm not just saying it to say it. We desperately need the infinite God of the Bible, who's the only true God, the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. We need our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who's alive forevermore, who is alive, who is reality, who is life. Death is not the end of our existence. But the door through which we enter to Behold his face, either in love or in judgment. And folks, we are all damaged. I'm very damaged. I have a lot of issues, anger issues, <clears throat> impatience, lack of self-control, <clears throat> unworthiness, low self-esteem, you name it. And I need healing, deep healing, deep, deep inner healing, which only the blood of our God and Savior Jesus Christ can give us by the power of the Holy Spirit. So... We love you, Father. We love you, Abba, Avinu, Alahan, Chayyanu, Baban, Babi. We love you, Son of God, Lord Jesus. We love you. The heart of the Father become flesh. We love you. We cling to you. We cleave to you. We depend on you. We trust you, Lord Jesus, Son of God. Have mercy on us and wash us in your blood, Lord Jesus. Save us from our flesh. Save us from our sinful passions. Save us from our moral failures, Lord Jesus. Save us from our <clears throat> psychological wounds and our emotional wounds and our <clears throat> spiritual wounds and our physical wounds heal us lord jesus not to shame you not to disgrace you but to shine with your glorious light and your beauty and your holiness and love and passion please lord jesus i fail you because of my anger and my impatience my pride save me from that lord jesus increase in us lord jesus may we decrease sit and throne upon our hearts son of god lord jesus our Lord, our God, our, our love, our life, set a throne upon our hearts and the hearts of our loved ones. My daughters, Lord Jesus, wash them in your blood. Love them and save them from irreparable damage. And I pray that for everyone here and their loved ones. Fill us with the Spirit. Holy Spirit, we love you. We worship you. We adore you. We depend on you. We cling to you. Holy Spirit, take over the session. Crucify my flesh to never shame the Lord Jesus Christ. Please. Save me from my moral failures, not to be a stumbling block and not to stumble because of others and their moral failures. Holy Spirit, transform us to conform to the glory of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Bless this session. Bless it for the glory of Jesus. Bless the internet connection. Bless everyone. Illuminate them. Even this man, convict them to see the error of his ways. Please, Holy Spirit, and destroy my impatience and fill us with wisdom and knowledge and insight, understanding and love and devotion and purity and holiness towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Perfect my ability, recall the scriptures, interpret them correctly without error, and live them out by your power. All of us living them out by your power. And fill my lungs and my chest and my throat and my heart with, with health and life. Strengthen my voice, keep it strong for the glory of Jesus and anoint its sound to be pleasing to the ears of your slaves, Holy Spirit, and take over the session. Be with us and guide the conversation. Save me from error, error, stammering, stuttering, confusion. Loosen my tongue for the glory of the Lord Jesus, the Father's heart. Please, Holy Spirit, and be with us. We need you. We love you. 
We love you, Son of God. We love you, Father. Our Father, my Father, because of Jesus, I can call you Abba, Babi, my Father. We can all call you that because of the Lord Jesus that you sent to do for us what we could not do for ourselves, giving us the Holy Spirit of adoption. In Jesus' name, Yahweh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yahweh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. This is impromptu. I was planning to do something later on. But this gentleman reached out to me and he called me. Pray that I can show him in love and mercy for the Lord Jesus Christ, the air of his ways, and not lose my testimony. If he's one of those that's not fully there, then we'll end the conversation. So now pray. I'm going to call him. Yad M. Shikha. Hold on. Let me do this. Yad M. Shikha. Father, Son, Spirit. Be glorified. It's not an ego fest. See, save me. Okay, invite folks. Yad M. Shikha. Man, I look too young now. Renee. Renee, I'm scaring you. I'm looking younger than you now. Look at me, man. I look like I'm in my 20s. Hold on, hold on. That ego, the egomaniac. Egomaniac. See this place up here, man. We got to do something with this bicep. Come on. Come on, man. We got to get some tone. Lord Jesus, save me from vanity. Lord Jesus, save me from vanity. All right. Now, what happens, Riaz, just before I call him, I used to have a good barber in Chicago. He would trim my beard, right? But now here in this state, I don't know who to go to to trim my beard. So what happens is it gets too bushy, too thick. So I have to now just do what I do and let it grow again. Right? Hey, Thomas, by the way, you guys know Thomas. Thomas is my precious little brother. He's not just my brother in Jesus Christ. Thomas is also my little brother. We grew up in the same neighborhood. We grew up in the same neighborhood. You know, uh, his brother, Yo-Yo, was about a year or two older than me, about two years. And he was a young man, and I can say this, and I mean this. I love this young man. He's not a young man anymore. He's married, and he's got three handsome boys. I'm not going to give their names. Three handsome boys. Can you pray for him? Pray for his young sons to be warriors in love with Jesus Christ. Pray for their health and safety. Pray for their provision. Pray the Lord Jesus will bless my brother Thomas. I love him from my heart, and I mean that. I love him. You know, In fact, if I start thinking about it, I'll end up crying because one thing I'm going to share with you guys. The best years of my life were on Clark Street. Foster and Clark Street in the 70s, 80s. We used to call it Kempit Jelwaya. We grew up there, and the friendships we have last to this day. All of these young men and the women that <clears throat> I grew up with, we love each other from the depth of our heart. It's like when we see each other, it's like we just start where we left off, the love we have for each other. And he's a young man I love passionately i love his sister who went to school with me we graduated pray for his family pray for his sisters pray for his brother pray for his beloved mother see i'm about to cry dude pray for his beloved mother pray god will bless her and love her extend her earthly life she'll be a peaceful life and pray for his his wife because it was his wife who lost her younger sister to cancer. She was 33 and not too long ago, what, about a week ago, the Lord Jesus called her, summoned her home. She's now pain-free, cancer-free. She's now alive, deathless, filled with the love and joy of Jesus Christ. But she has left a hole in the hearts of her family because she was young. So pray for, for him. Anyway, if I start thinking, I'm going to start crying. I got to not, I, I'm going to end up crying because I love these guys. I love them. May, if I have found favor with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in spite of my imperfections, I ask the Lord Jesus to bless all of them, all of those friendships from Clark Street. Lord, bless them. Use me to, to bless them. And even those friendships that I forged on Devon Street, bless them, Son of God. In Jesus' name. Anyway, let me begin. I'm going to end up crying, dude. Ah, yeah. Why don't you turn off the YouTube session that you've been spying on me, dude? Come on, Robin. 
Robin, you there? I'm not spying on you, good sir. No, no, I'm kidding with you. I'm playing with you. Yes, hey, Robin. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I'm just kidding with you. Listen to me. Uh, where's Batman? Robin, where's Batman? You're not answering my question. God's Batman. Huh? God is Batman. No, okay, okay. listen, by the way, I can hear kids in the background. You got to be a little louder, get closer to your mic, because I can oh, hear your kids. I'm sorry. Right. I'll bring it closer. Is that better? Yeah. You were trying to convince me that God is, uh, that Jesus is God the Father? Yes. Why? You don't believe that? He's not God the Father. You don't he's believe God. he's the Father? Are you asking me? Do you are have they, the answer? No. Or do you want to talk over him? Robin, do you want me to block you, or are you going to listen and pretend that you're listening? Sorry. Are you going to listen? Because if I'm wasting my time, let me know so I can block you now. Okay. Yeah, you're not I, okay. Listening. I don't believe he's the father. He is God, but he's not the father. Why do you believe he's God the father? You say he's God the father. John 14, 9. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. That doesn't prove he's the father because you're not reading it in context. Why did you start at 9? Why don't you read 7? All the way to 21. Can you do that for me instead of just taking verses you like out of context? Are you ready? Yeah, let's totally oh, let's do it. Do it. Totally. What's totally cool, it? man. Gnarly, man. All right. Go to John 14. Read 7 for me. Let's break it down in several sections. Read John 14. I want you to read 7 to 12. Get John 14 up here, sir. Gnarly, man. Cool. Let's go surfing, dude. All right. Anyway, John 14, 7 to 12. Slowly and loudly. What translation are you reading? Sorry? What translation are you reading? I'm reading KJV. Oh, okay. King James. Would you like me to share screens? No, it's what, dude, I don't need your screen. I just need you to read louder so they can hear you. Hey, guys, by the way, have you noticed even cultists, heretics use the King James? You see how powerful King James is? It's even used by cultists and heretics. But go ahead. Read for me John 14, 7 to 12 slowly. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> Sorry. John 14, 7. If you have known me, you should have always known my father also. And from henceforth, can you know speak him louder, him brother? Just speak louder. Seeing him. Yeah, speak louder. And then henceforth, you have seen him. Go ahead. Okay. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the father, and it suffices us. Mm -hmm. Jesus said unto him, have I been so long a time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? Yeah. She that has seen me has seen the Father. Keep going. And that, and how thou sayest then, show us the Father. Yep. Keep going. Believe thou not that I am the Father, and the no, Father. No, you you misread that. You didn't say I am the Father. Sorry. See, you're here. No, hold on. Wait, 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 Robin. Robin, pay attention. Robin. Sorry. Listen. See, that's the demonization, how Satan has demonized you. You even misread what was in front of your eyes. You read, do you believe not I am the Sorry. Father? That's the devil that's trying to control you. But by the grace of Jesus, may you be set free. He didn't say, I am the Father. You see? Read it again. Yes. Believe thou not that I am in the Father and yes. the Father in me. That's right. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not myself. But the Father that dwelleth in me, he does the work. Mm. Okay, so uh -huh. the reason why Jesus said, you see me, see the Father. What was the reason that he gave right there? Because he is the Father. Okay, That's I'm going to ask you one more time, and I'm going to block you if you don't answer honestly. Why did he say, he who sees me, sees the Father? He just gave you the answer right there. Why? Yeah, you've seen me, you've seen the Father, Why? because he is the Father. Okay, this is the third time I'm going to muzzle you and the demon in you, because you just read it, and you're didn't. you you're so blind by the, your father, the devil, you're not seeing it. I'm going to ask you a third time, listen carefully. He just explained to you why when you see him, you see the Father. What was the answer given? It was right there in front of your eyes, but the demon in you is blinding you, but Jesus is almighty, he can destroy that demon and set you free, which is what I'm hoping will happen. In Jesus' name. What was okay. the answer? Everyone in the text got it. What is it? You don't see it, honestly? Now, be honest with me. I'm being very honest with you, sir. Don't call me, sir, because uh, you make me feel old. You could treat me as a buddy. So, you, honestly, you don't see the answer? What is it the answer you want me to see? 
<laughs> the passage is in front of your face. <laughs> it's not funny. It's right in front of you. Read it again. Let's see if you're going to get it. I want you to read 9 all the way to 11 again. Okay. Jesus said, saith unto him, Have I been so long, so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? Yes. He that hath seen, he that seen me has seen the Father. Yep. And how saith thou then, show us us the Father? Believe thou not that I am the Father? No, you did it again. Father. You just misread it again. Why believe keep reading it as him saying, believe thou the that I am the Father? Father in me. Okay, one more time. Why did you just misread it a second time that he said, I am the Father? Because I'm a little nervous talking to okay, you. Okay, then I'm going to make you feel all right, all right. Okay, if that's the case, Robin, I'll be gentle because I don't want you to be nervous. All right, sorry. My apologies, brother. My brother in humanity. I don't want you to be nervous, but see, let me tell you why I reacted the way I do. Understand my context. Before we move on, I understand my context. I deal with heretics, Agreed. cultists, all day, every day for years. So I'm always trigger happy when someone comes and I sense they're perverting scripture and distorting it. That's my reaction. But if you're really sincere, I'll be very kind with you if you're sincere. Now, let me read what you obviously miss. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is what? Dwelleth in? Read that. Read for me 10 11. Believe thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? That's the answer. The that Before you move on. The answer is, the reason why when you see Jesus, you see the Father, because the Father is dwelling in him, working through him. Now read verse 11. Okay. Believe me that I am Father and the Father. So you did it again a third time. My goodness. Me. Oh, my goodness. Oh, wait, 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 wait. You did it a third time. Wow. You just read 11 again. Believe me, I am the Father. You just read it again a third time, dude. Okay, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Okay, why three consecutive times you misread that passage? Why did you read, I am the Father? No, no, you didn't. I'm you read it three times as, me. I am the Father. Okay. It's just nerves. That's all it Come is. Come on, man. No, it's not nerves. I can bring my eight-year-old daughter who's nervous, and she can read the words plainly. I am in the Father. It's not a coincidence. A coincidence. Three consecutive times you omitted the word in. Okay, now. I believe read 11. is in the Father. I okay. agree with you. Okay, no, no. You're not, not going to agree with me when I finish it. No, you're not going to agree with me. Hold on. You're going to see you're not going to agree with me. You think you are, but now read 11 one more time. Believe me that i am in the father okay. and the father in me okay. or else believe me for the very works sake okay so believe me that the works i do prove the father is now in me dwelling in me and i'm in him and working together now read verse 12. verily verily i say unto you he that believeth on me the works that i do shall he do also and greater works than these shall he do mm -hmm. because i go on to my father okay now i want you to now read very carefully i am go i go on to my father now listen to my question because i don't want you to tap dance if jesus is the father then he wouldn't be going to the father he is the father already so why is he going to the father if he is the father This is the multiple capacity of God. That's why the three are one. That's not what he says. Nope. That's not what he said. He didn't say it's a multiple capacity of God. He my says, father the Father is in me, and I'm going to go back to the Father. He does say, the Father. Say it again. Sorry? I didn't hear you. What? The Father and I, the father and I are one. Just like the disciples agree. are one. John 17, 11. So Peter is John in a different multiplication. John 17, 11. Same word, one, hen, use of the disciples being one. So now, according to your logic, Peter is John. John is Peter. It's just the multiplication of the same person, Peter. John 17, 11. Read that for me. 
John 17, 11? Yes. Sorry, let me get this. I am, and now more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, thine own name, though who thou hast given me, and that they may be one as we are. So notice, they're going to be one just like we are one, Father. So Peter and John and Matthew and Thomas will be one just as the Father and the Son are one. So is Peter John? Only three bear the record. No, that's not answering Only my question. Don't do the tap dance. Is Peter John? That's not a... Yeah, answer the verse. Sorry, you no. went to First John five. That's a different context. It's going to backfire no, against not... you. John seventeen eleven. Is Peter John? John seventeen eleven. Yeah, is Peter John? See, this is the third time I'm asking you the question. Absolutely not. Wait, but they are one, just as the Father and the Son are one. Why is he not John? They are not. It doesn't say that they are one. Read it again, verse 11. It's in front of your eyes. Read it one more time. John 17, 11. You think, hold on, do you believe Read that the verse. Don't debate me. Read Peter? the verse. Don't debate me. Read the verse. And I am no more in this world, in the world. This is clearly Jesus. Speaking. No, it's it's uh, it's it's actually Moses. Yeah, don't change the subject. Read the verse because the verse is going to backfire against you. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those who thou has given me, and sorry that they may be one as we are. So the disciples will be one, the same way the Father and the Son are one. So let me repeat the question. No, that is. No, that's Jesus. what it just said. It just said that. That's Jesus. Yeah. Jesus says, they may be one. Who? My followers. It's right there. They may be one as we, Father, are one. So he's saying the disciples will be yeah. one just as the Father and Son are one. And you said, let me repeat what you said. Father and Son are okay. one because Jesus is the Father. Listen more than you speak because you're not hearing me. You said... Father and Son are one because Jesus is the Father. But then he said the disciples will be one the way we are one. So is Peter now Thomas because they're going to be one the same way the Father and Son are one, which you used to prove that Jesus is okay, the same person as the Father. That. I can explain that easily. Go ahead. We are going to all be one after resurrection. Okay, so am I going to be Peter? You're going to be me? Not now. No, you're, it doesn't matter when. Stop the red herring. Even at the resurrection, am I going to be you? I'm going to be a different person than you. We are going to be one with Christ. At Didn't point. answer the question. This is now the fourth time I'm going to ask you. Am I going to be you when we become one at the resurrection? Yes. Oh, In my essence, goodness. Yes. I'm going to be you? The body of Christ. Okay, become wait. One. I'm going to be you? We're going to be one. We're going to be Am I going to so be you? God's will is in our hearts and our minds. Right. Okay. No. So I'm not going to be you. But we are going to be one in the Okay, but doesn't mean we're going to be one person, right? No, but you see we'll be one. Oh, good. So we're not going to be one person, though we'll be united, right? We'll be united, but we won't be the same person, right? God is not a respecter of persons. Okay, do you... We are not going to be persons. I'm not a person. You're not a person. What God are you? An animal? A person. dog? What are you? A flea? A rat? What are you? God is not a. God did not create okay. persons. God has bye no bye. respect for persons. Bye so bye, sir. You're using the. Bye bye. Ooh. Take care. And this guy's got a YouTube channel, preaching the gospel. All right. All right. You guys got it. You can't reason with someone like that. Sorry, guys. They look for me. I don't look for them. I just want to be for, just want to repeat for the record, for the record, for the record. I don't look for them. They look for me. These trolls, these heretics come to my channel, pontificate, run their mouths, spew their blasphemies, and they think I'm going to let them get away with it. So this is why I have them come on my Skype, because it doesn't take more than 10 minutes for these heretics to expose themselves that they don't know the Bible, they're Bible perverts that are demonized. May the Lord Jesus have mercy on them and set them free. If not, may the Lord give them what they deserve for deceiving people. 
And that's why then I block them and they can't comment on my comment section. You see how easy that is? You see how that easy that is? Anyway. So with that said, can we go on to other pressing issues? Because last night I wanted to discuss, and I'll do I will retitle this. Last night, his name is Robin Mitchell. Robin Mitchell. Robin Mitchell, M-I-T-C-H-E-L-L, -L. Robin Mitchell. Okay, yep. Last night, I wanted to discuss the topic of hell, Satan's fall, and how Bible per Bible versions matter. Do you want me to continue the discussion, which I could not engage in, because another tool of the devil, let me just be honest, I know people don't like my language, another satanic whore, a spiritual whore, a wicked demonic whore, was used of the devil to distract me, someone who masquerades as a Christian, without mentioning her name, she goes around, sends pictures of her nude to brothers in Christ. Timothy Cole, that's what you told me yesterday, right? You told me that this unnamed person sent nude pictures of them to you, right? That's what you told me last night. I just want to make sure I didn't misread what you said. I mean, you're there, bro, because this demon would not relent. She would not stop texting me, telling me, you know, defend my honor, defend my honor. He's slandering me and would not stop, man, would not stop. But Timothy, I need to hear you quickly, brother. No, this is yesterday. Uh, and, you know, I'm kind of shocked because I didn't think that. But OK, see, Timothy just said, yes, I saved her Facebook for proof. All right. I am proud of you, sir. Let me tell you why I'm proud of you. May the Lord Jesus make us men and women of integrity. I am proud of you, sir, that you didn't succumb to her enticement because that shows that you do want to follow Jesus Christ and love Jesus Christ. And may the Lord Jesus save us. And look, I understand. Look, let me just be upfront. I understand. It's a battle. There are beautiful sisters here who love Jesus Christ. They're battling. They want to find a godly man. And they want to fall in love. They're men. Look, I struggle too. It's a battle for me. I have passions too. I struggle. And in my heart, I desire to find a godly woman who loves Jesus, who's beautiful. But at the same time, I want to be single because you know why? I got issues. Let me just share with you. Because of my issues, I don't want to be a burden on a sister. Because of my issues, I don't want to bring a sister down, break her heart, and disappoint her because we are damaged. We are damaged. I don't know anyone who is in my chat channel right now who's not damaged. Okay? We are psychologically, we are emotionally, spiritually damaged from broken families, broken relationships, from life. And we are hurting. And we need healing. We need the Lord Jesus to wash us, the Holy Spirit transform us and make us whole. And at times we enter relationships expecting that the partner will be our healer. You know, let me exp give you really quick. I'm not making this about marriage now, but really quick. The reason why many marriages fail is because even among believers, even among believers, listen to me. I want, I'm speaking from my heart. Even among believers, you have believers who though they love Jesus, still are looking for a human individual to fulfill them and heal them. And so they go into marriage thinking, this woman is a Christian, she will be my savior. Or this man is a Christian, he'll be my savior. And then when they come together, they realize they're two sick individuals, broken individuals who cannot satisfy the other because they can't even satisfy themselves. And so now they have broken expectations, broken dreams that were not anchored in reality and want out of the marriage. And that's why marriage is and among Christians. Last time I checked, there was about, what, a 50% divorce rate among those who profess to be evangelical Christians. In fact, I had a brother tell me, a brother in Lord Jesus told me that his Coptic priest, you know what he said? And the brother knows who I'm talking about. Maybe he can confirm if I mentioned the details. It was like over two years ago. He told me his Coptic priest said, never in his lifetime as a, as a priest, has he seen more Coptic marriages fail and get divorced? 
you know that? He said that. He goes, in all my life, he goes, in the 80s, it was very rare. 90s, rare. He goes, now, he is shocked at the alarming rate of how many Coptics end up in divorce. And one thing he told me, it's, for the most part, initiated by the women. Now, sometimes, I understand why the women do it, because the men are jerks. They're not really Christians. They are male whores who feign Christianity. But at times, it's, that's not the case. So I understand my brothers and sisters. I understand your struggle. I understand. I struggle, dude. I'm not a monk. Look, I am not a monk. I struggle. I desire a godly woman that we can grow together in love with Jesus. But at the same time, I realize I have issues. I got issues. So, God, if you can deliver me from my passions and just give me the grace to be like Paul, I'll remain single until you take me because it's hard. It's hard when you have issues and then you enter a relationship with someone else with issues. There are failed expectations. And then Satan comes in and brings chaos and destruction. So I understand. But let me tell you, my sisters, let me tell you, my sisters. Out of love for Jesus Christ, though you love the Lord and though you want to finally got godly man. Do not let Satan tempt you to follow shortcuts and tempt men to sin. It happens to all of us. Maintain purity. Don't shame yourself in the eyes of others so they don't discredit your testimony as a follower of Jesus Christ. And men, guard your hearts. Protect yourselves. Don't open the door because once you open it, you will fail. Lord Jesus, forgive me and save me from my failures as well. And we have godly sisters here. We have godly sisters. MG, I don't know if she's here. Is she here? I don't know. She's probably sleeping. MG, she's a godly sister. Renee, godly sister. Right? Zina, godly sister. Bratam Shicha, godly sister. No, but anyway, yeah. They are godly sisters. They love the Lord. Do they got issues? Oh, boy. <laughs> Talk about Zina and Bratam Shicha. Right? Even Tatiana is a godly sister, loves the Lord, but I don't mention her because she believes there is no valid reason to remarry until one of the spouses die. Even if one of the spouses are sexually immoral, still, you're stuck till one of them die. Now, I'm praying God changes her mind sooner than later. <laughs> Just kidding. All right. Anyway, anyway, let's get back to the issue. With that said, let's get back to the issue. All right. Everyone ready? G Alma, and you're humble about it. Alma Calvo says, I'm a godly woman, and she's humble about it. She's humble about it. Well, Diana, that's what I'm doing, MGTOW. How'd you know I'm doing MGTOW? <laughs> you're a smart girl. I'm doing MGTOW. Now, let me wait on questions. Okay. Lord, please get her to see the correct understanding of Scripture. She can remarry. Please, Lord, open her eyes. Please. No, anyway, let's come back. All right. Guys, hold off your questions because I want to discuss the fall of Satan and the issue of hell and Bible translations. Are we ready? Let me even shut down my Skype for now. I'll open up a little. Are you guys interested? Do you guys want me to talk about this topic? Yeah, well, Timothy, I didn't. It wasn't you, Timothy. You didn't start the drama. She did by calling me. Now, pray for Timothy. Pray God convict her that she truly repents and falls in love with Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean she's not a sister. Okay, guys, let me just be clear. Let me be clear. You can be of Jesus and still be used of the devil because of your weakness to, weakness to cause men to stumble. Let me repeat again. You can still be a believer in Jesus Christ, a child of God, but still because of your weakness, be used of the devil, manipulated by the devil, right? To cause someone to stumble. That doesn't mean you're not a believer. Because if you go by that criterion, David was not a believer. He must have been a fake Christian who's in hell. Because he lusted for a married woman, slept with her, got her pregnant, murdered the man. And he was still a believer who was still used of the Lord Jesus, who was still born of the Spirit, but who got rebuked, chastened, disciplined severely. So it doesn't mean she's not a believer. It means she's weak 
And in her weakness is being manipulated by Satan to cause men to, to stumble. May the Lord Jesus save her from that whoredom, her weakness, and purify her. Right? So you got to be careful. And if we use that as an argument to condemn people, Samson, who's in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. Samson is listed as a man of faith, a mighty judge that God used mightily. European winter. You're saying, I'm a whore like you? Good job, European. I'm a spiritual whore like you? Oh, all right. Takes one to know one, I guess. Thank you. And this guy thinks he's going to upset me. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm hurt. I'm hurt. I hurt my feelings. Some slime scum thinks I'm... Anyway, let me give you an example of uh, Samson. In Judges 16, verse 1, it says, Samson went to Gaza and found a harlot, a whore, a prostitute, and slept with her. He slept with a whore, a prostitute. Still, God disciplined, punished him severely, but still God did not reject him and cut him off from saving grace. So be careful in being quick to condemn people like European whore. I'm sorry, European winter. Because European prostitute, I mean European winter, this whore, I'm sorry, this uh, so-called Christian can still be a Christian, but a filthy dog, I mean a weak tool of the devil, right? Sorry about that. Sorry, European whore. I mean winter. See, man, you keep confusing me, dude. Anyway, let's focus, all right? Can we regroup? Can we focus? These guys don't know me too well. They think they can insult me, and I'll say, oh, okay, brother, I'll turn the other cheek. Jesus loves you. Forgive you. Okay, brother, I'll, I'll forgive you. I'll pray for you. Her, turn your cheek. Okay, now, here's the problem. What happens when you run out of cheeks? I turn the other cheek. Okay, I'm out of cheeks. Uh-huh. Okay, you hit me here, no? Huh? No, you hit me here. No, I'm out of cheeks. Agamini, that thou will babu. Now, here, give me your cheek. I got to see. I got, right? All right, there you go. I'm out of cheeks. Surprise, David. Surprise. Man, dude, I'm looking gorgeous. You know, I'm looking so gorgeous and handsome, I was about to ask myself out. Hey, man, would you go out with me? I'm sorry. Hey, hey, man, I can't go that way. Sorry. Man, dude, I'm tempting myself. I'm tempting myself to stumble. Okay, are we ready now? Let's regroup, regroup by the grace of our God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Let's regroup. Let's refocus and help me to help you now. Here's where I need you to help me. Do not let Satan distract you. Please, in Jesus' name, may the blood of Jesus shield us, spirit seal us. Focus on the topic. Only ask, please, relevant questions and do not engage in side talk. Later on, I will open up the Skype for questions. Yes, Timothy, but remember, that's an adulterous whore who does not repent. There are adulteresses who repent. Don't forget the woman caught in adultery. John 7, 53 to 8, 11. What did our Lord Jesus say to her? Let's look at John 8, 10 to 11. John 8, 10 to 11. Let's, let's read this. And we're going to read what Paul says about what we were. Now, when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw no one but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, no man, Lord, no man. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. You see, I have forgiven you, but now go and sin no more. I didn't forgive you to continue your immoral lifestyle. I have forgiven you of what you've done and now want to change you to be a holy slave of the living God, a precious, beautiful daughter of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he said. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 11. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 11. Watch here what Paul says. We're going to get there, Mary. We will. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 11. Yes, stop sinning completely, meaning Yahweh be glorified. The goal of every Christian is to be sinless. That's your goal. Try all you can by the strength supplied by the Holy Spirit to be sinless. But realize if you fail and, and succumb and stumble, you can cry to the Lord Jesus, the God of infinite mercy, and he'll forgive you and pick you up and resume the course until you reach heaven. First Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 11. Know ye not 
that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither did God need. I'm sorry. See, this is what happens when you chime in. Be not deceived. Okay. Neither fornicators. That's the sexual immoral, sexually immoral. Nor idolaters. Nor adulterers. Nor effeminate. Nor abusers of themselves of mankind. I'll explain what effeminate. Oh, should I? Because we have sisters here. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, this is talking about the homosexual relation. Effeminate abusers of themselves mankind means the homosexual relation where one man assumes the role of a woman in that relationship. Yeah, that's how graphic it is. Anyway, nor abusers of themselves of mankind as Holy Spirit guides me. Please, Holy Spirit, save me from error to speak truth. Please guide me not to make mistakes for the glory of Jesus Christ to speak the truth for his glory. Verse 11. Now watch here. Nor thieves, nor covetous. Nor drunkards, drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now notice Timothy, everyone else, verse 11. And such were some of you. Some of you were adulterers. Some of you were extortioner, extortioners. Some of you were effeminate homosexuals and the active homosexual partner. Some of you were all that. But now, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, set apart from that. But you are justified. You are declared and made righteous by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. Right? You didn't miss much. We're about to begin. Okay, let's see. Who's, who's calling me now? Pekka, what do you want? Katari. Pekka, what's going on? I'm about to do a session. Pekka, Katari, I'm about to do a session. I'm not taking calls, so I'll take calls later. All right. Are we ready now? Are we ready? Now, let me give you some links. First of all, let me give you one link to the issue of Genesis 126 and the plural pronouns. According to evangelical scholars like Michael Heise and others, the plural pronouns where God says, let us make man in our image and our likeness, found like in Genesis 126, which I just cited, or in Genesis 3, 5, it's God speaking to the heavenly council. Now, here's an article. I wrote for my blog. That's not the view of the unanimous interpretation of the early church fathers. This is not the view of the early church. If you read the writings of the church fathers, the apostolic fathers, the apologists, all of them that I'm aware of, and if I'm wrong, Lord Jesus, forgive me, and may he correct me if I'm wrong and bring it to my attention. So far, what I've seen, and I'm not a scholar, I've been studying that, even as far back as the epistle of Barnabas, which some date in the first century, these pronouns where God is speaking, let us make man in our image and after our likeness, or the man has become like one of us. They took it as a reference to the father speaking to the son and even the Holy Spirit. This was the ancient heritage of the church. So here's the article again. So folks, can I ask you a question? There's the article. Click on it, read it, use it. And then I give you links to the actual father's writings that you can read online. Okay. Are you with me there, folks? Now, if you have the very companions of the apostles, the disciples of the apostles, and the disciples of the disciples of the apostles, affirming that this is the father speaking to the son and even the Holy Spirit, that's how they interpreted the pronouns, the plural pronouns. That it's the triune God, the Father, speaking to the Son, the Lord Jesus, and even the Holy Spirit. Would you rather err on the side of the fathers who were eyewitnesses to the apostles and the disciples of the disciples of the apostles and agree with them or with modern critical scholarship? Now here, let me get rid of this dog. Hold on, let me get rid of this dog. Sorry, guys. This guy's barking, and I got to just silence. I'm sorry. I'm going to give you another link. Another filthy dog who thinks he's a Christian. Oh, these guys don't learn. Because you are a barking dog and can't be patient, let me make it quick and end your career as a Christian apologist. Are you ready? That's great. Oh, that's great. Okay. Uh, explain to me Jesus' relationship to Israel. Can you hear me? Okay, can you hear me? Explain to me Jesus' relationship to Israel. 
What happened at 70 AD? Am I, am I talking to Sam right now? No, you're talking to his mother. His mother is here speaking to Sam. Okay. Okay. Listen to what I'm saying. I'm going to hang up at you if you talk over me. Listen. Explain okay. to me what happened with Jesus and Israel in 70 AD. When Jesus said, I, I have a problem hearing you. I'm sorry. I'm a okay, let me try it again. You know? Explain to me what Jesus did with Israel in 70 AD. Yeah, he cut them off. He cut them off. What oh, is yes. that called covenantally, that cutting off? Yes, that means that they're no longer the people of God. No, no. Let's be more specific because they're the bride of God. So when he cut them off, what does that mean covenantally? What did he do? Yeah, they were, I mean, it's from the cross. It happens from the cross. No, it didn't happen from the cross. It happened at 70 AD because even after the resurrection, he sent the apostles to tell them all things are fulfilled. So let me repeat the question a third time and send you on your merry way. What did he do covenantally to his bride Israel at 70 AD? Well, he, uh, he, he said the way, of course, he divorced them. Oh, he said Ooh. it. You got it. He divorced them. Thank you. End of story. You heard it, right? He divorced them. Beautiful. Did you guys hear it? At least that came out real quickly. Did you hear what he said? He divorced them. So Jesus is not against divorce, contrary to Tatiana and those who believe like her. And please don't debate me, Tatiana. He challenged me, so I put him in his place. He divorced them. So if anyone tells you there is no legitimate grounds for divorce, they're going to pervert scripture to agree with their position. And I, too, at one time even embraced that view. But I'm not having that debate. But you heard it clearly, right? Jesus is God Almighty who doesn't act inconsistently to his law. He divorced them. Did you hear that? Divorce them. Oh, okay. Now, can we get back to the topic? You see why I don't? Guys, can I, can I be upfront with you? Can I be upfront with you? I don't just want to debate any Joe Schmo. I don't want to debate any Joe Schmo who thinks he knows the Bible and has the requisite knowledge to debate me. This is going to come off arrogant. I know people think I'm an arrogant jerk. And you know what? I am. God save me. It's not because I think I'm a know-it-all. It's because the people that contact me, I can tell they don't know the scriptures. They think they do. And they still want to come on and prove me wrong. And by the way, there are Christians who are knowledgeable who disagree that you can legitimately remarry. Okay? There are people who think that. Fine. You want to think that? That's between you and God. But here's what I don't tolerate. Can I be honest what I don't tolerate? Let me tell you what I don't tolerate. Some of them will then look upon others who have remarried and say that you're an adulterer. You're an, you're an adultery. You're an adultery. You are an adulteress or an adult. You know, adulterer. You're an adulteress or an adulterer. So they'll even come out and say you're in adultery. You're committing adultery. Okay. You're going to have to answer to Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I'm going to have to answer. And I got a lot to answer for. Lord Jesus, wash us in your blood and have mercy. Now, with that said, can we focus on the topic? Can we focus on the topic? Right? You want to agree with that position? Keep it to yourself. This idiot's the one who wants to debate me, right? Anyway, can we focus now in Jesus' name? Let's say our Lord's Prayer and begin, okay? Please help me to help you. Don't let the children of the devil or even Christians who in their ignorance are used of the devil to cause us to be distracted. Yeah. No, Diana, they say you can't do that either. Diana, you're not getting it. Diana, my sister. They don't believe that even the case of adultery... The marriage is dissolved. They don't believe that. They interpret Jesus' words differently or Matthew's ex exception clause. Okay. Are you guys, you guys don't understand? There is a position, right, that says that they cannot remarry even for adultery. But Catholic Crusader, even in the Catholic Church, you have annulment, right, where you annul marriages that were not valid, validly performed. Now, to an outsider, Catholic Crusader, that looks like a divorce, but you're not counting it as a marriage, so you don't count it as a divorce. You see, my brother? Don't you have in the Catholic Church what they call annulment, annulling marriages that were not sacramentally valid, so they were not considered marriages, even though the marriage was consummated sexually. To an outsider, I'm just letting you know, to an outsider who's not a Catholic, they'll say that's just a divorce. It's a divorce. It's simply a divorce. But they don't want to call it the divorce because they don't want to go against their belief that there is no remarriage until death. 
even in the case of adultery. So I don't want to get into this debate. I don't want to get into this debate, honestly. And I, there is one of your apologists, a very famous apologist, who had to do that because he remarried, because his wife cheated and defiled the marriage bed. And he had to get an annulment and be remarried, right? Now, I don't know if it's public knowledge. So I don't want to mention his name. I can't mention his name. I don't want to mention his name. But now, see, guys, we're being distracted, right? Can we come back to the issue? Can we come back to the issue? Can we focus? All right. Please help me to help you. These are the disagreements that we're going to disagree until Jesus comes and then transforms us. Here's the article again. The early church fathers interpreted the plural pronouns of Genesis 126, 3, 5, even Isaiah 11, 8, as the Father speaking to a Son, the Lord Jesus, and even the Holy Spirit. They didn't interpret the plural pronouns as God speaking to the divine counsel. There is some tradition among Jews that believe that, that God was speaking to the angels. But in the ancient church, the disciples of the apostles and their followers after them interpret them as Trinitarian references, as references to the triune Godhead, as the Father speaking to the Son and the Spirit. In Genesis 1.26, in Genesis 3.5, and Isaiah 6.1. So now let me repeat. Save that article. I just gave it to you. We'll put it in the description box. It's there. If you click on it, turn on. I'm not kidding. You'll read it with your own eyes. And I give you a link to the Father's writings in English online for free. Let me ask you a question here. Let me ask you a question. If the very generation of those who knew the apostles and their followers after them interpret these passages as the triune God speaking in the plural, Plural pronouns in reference to the triune God conversing among themselves. Do you think it's safer to err on their side and accept that view than go with what modern critical scholarship, evangelical scholarship, says about those pronouns? What do you guys think? Which leads me to another point I want to make. Let me bring this up because I posted on Facebook. Let me tell you what's happening to our own scholars. Our old scholars. Here, let me show you something. You ready? You guys ready for me, right? That's why I'm here. Trusting the Holy Spirit to fill me for the glory of Jesus and save me from error. So I can bless you and sharpen you. Not me, but the Spirit working through me for the glory of Jesus Christ. What happened with Sargun David? Oh, I'm sorry. Diana, I thought Diana was uh, kosher. Sargun, that's easy. I thought she was one of us. Anyway, let me say the Lord's Prayer. Let's begin, all right? All right. Let's come together in agreement. Our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, both now and forever, unto ages of ages. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. And by the way, those of you from the Assyrian Church of the East, Assyrian Church of the East, here's you're going to see where these ancient churches disagree with each other. Real quickly, just one more point. The Assyrian Church of the East, this is where you see the disagreements among these ancient apostolic traditions, right? The Assyrian Church of the East will allow members of the church to remarry after seven years, seven years from their divorce. Now, can anyone guess why seven years later? I just want to make that real point that point real quickly. Why seven years later? That's the tradition. Anyone know? No, because in the Old Testament, you had the seventh year Sabbath where debts were released. You were released of debts, and if you had a debt, it'd be canceled, or if you were in servitude, it'd be canceled. Seventh year was the year of releasing, redeeming, being set freed. So that's why the seventh year. Seventh year, you've been released from the marital bond. So Tatiana, be careful, Tatiana. And the Rachel Ita. All right. All right, come on now. Okay, you ready now? Let's focus. 
Yep, seventh year from the Old Testament Hebrew Scriptures, right? In fact, I've been told, side note, side note, related to this issue of marriage, and we'll come back. And the Assyrian Church of the East can confirm, maybe Sergun or others who would know more than me because I'm learning the tradition, and hopefully I'll learn, learn it thoroughly. I've been also told that women on their monthly cycle cannot take communion. If a woman is on her monthly cycle, she cannot take communion because they still observe those aspects of the Torah of Moses. You with me there? Because, Angie, the women have to be honest to their conviction. In other words, the woman has to know, look, I'm on my cycle, and I won't dishonor the, the church's <clears throat> statements or position. Thereby, I won't dishonor the Lord Jesus, and I won't take it. Right? Everyone there? That's what I've, I've been told. Zina, that's a good question, Zina, love. Because let me really quickly answer that question. Let me really quickly answer that question, Zina, love. It is a mistake to assume everything in the Old Testament has been done away with in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not the New Testament teaching. That's not the New Testament teaching. The New Testament teaching says we follow the law of Jesus Christ. Insofar as the law of Jesus Christ still binds you to keep those aspects of the Old Testament, we still observe them as a church. You with me there? So that means every serious student of the New Testament has to now prayerfully seek the Holy Spirit to help them understand how much of the Old Testament is still binding on us and the way that it was revealed, even though we're under the law of Jesus Christ. You with me there? So it is a mistake if you think none of the Old Testament is binding. That's not true. None of the Old Testament is binding. That is an error. Okay? For example... There's nothing explicit in the New Testament that says don't marry your sister and don't sleep with animals. Why? Because the New Testament already accepts as a given, presupposes as a given, the sexual ethical code of Leviticus 18 and 20 where you can't sleep with animals or siblings or parents. So they don't need to repeat that because they're still presupposing the validity of those commands and they're binding on us under the New Covenant. Yes, I do, uh, Mr. Molina. Right? So anyway, hopefully that's clear. So now, some churches will include certain aspects of the Mosaic Law and bind the members of their churches to honor those aspects. For example, I may be wrong again. I may be wrong. But my understand, Diana, do me a favor, sister, please. Sister, let's not get animated. Let's not get angry. Let's not fight. It's okay. See, Diana, dude, man, Diana, can I ask you, sis, uh, honestly, sister, are you single? And I'm not saying this to put you down. Are you single, sister? I just want to know. Okay. Can I, I just want to know if you're single. I want to know. Uh, just tell, let me know, and I'm not trying to put you down. Because you're going to stay single if you don't learn to control your anger. You're a hot-headed warrior for Jesus. You see? Diana, I say this in love, not to put you down. You are a hot-headed firecracker for Jesus. But you get too angry and too animated. Seriously. So I'm saying this in love for you, sister. You're going to scare men away. They don't want to get verbally and spiritually beat down by a lioness of Christ. They want to come to you. And they want you to nurture them and love them and affirm them. But with you, it's like Mike Tyson going 15 rounds. And they don't even make it past the first round, sister. Please, please. Not everything is a fight. Not everything is a battle. You don't have to. Hey, control your mind, Sam. Catholic Crusader, shut up. I'm Catholic too. Calm down, sister. Calm down. It's okay. You got timed out. It's okay. Calm down. You're the one that drove me nuts and I wanted to block you because everything was Catholic for you. Everything was that. Hey, Sam, Catholic Bible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, Catholic Church, Sam. Yeah. You wouldn't stop. Calm down. Sister, calm down. It's okay. Breathe. Here, here, sister, let me help you. Logos. 
Okay, it's all right. I promise you, if you learn to control your anger, I promise you, you're going to get married next year. Let me prophesy over you. Let me prophesy. I prophesy. I prophesy. Guys, get, let me get an amen. Let me get an amen. We're going to begin. I want an amen. I'm going to prophesy over you. I prophesy, Diana, next year, you will find a godly man, fall in love with him, and get married if you control your anger issue system. Can I get an amen? Can I get an amen? <laughs> preach, preach, preach. Woo. Oh, yeah. There we go. Okay, anyway. So, see? Remember, my prophecy is conditional. My prophecy is conditional, Diana. If you control your anger, you're going to get married to a godly man. See, it's a conditional prophecy. It's not unconditional. All right, anyway. Now, let's come back to the issue about scholarship. Okay, about scholarship. Evangelical scholarship. Razzles, I hope I stay in a good mood, brother. If you know what they did to me last night, I was about to. It wasn't Timmy who came off the hinges. I did because of last night what they did. Adam Sheikha, please, Father, save us from that for the glory of Jesus by the power of the Spirit. Now, the current state of evangelical scholarship has become scary. Okay, guys, I need your attention now as we try to go into meet and be serious. You see this book right here? Okay. I want you to see this book. And I got some more links to give you some articles. Okay. See this here? All right. This is N.T. Wright and Michael F. Byrd. N.T. Wright and Michael F. Byrd are considered two of the top evangelical scholars in the world. And they are conservative. They're conservative. Quotation marks. This is called The New Testament in Its World. This book was being promoted at the 2019... Evangelical Theological and Philosophical Society's annual meeting. Meeting, 2019, I was there. David Wood was there. Vocab was there. And Anthony Rogers was there. We were all there. We attended the meeting. All the top scholars are there. They give papers and all the publishers are there. And they are promoting this book. Written by two top evangelical scholars who are conservative, not liberal. Let me tell you the damage this book does. Let me show you something, okay? Let me show you this, the damage. I want you to click on it now. Click on it now. Okay, here you go. Paul Williams, who is a Christophobe, he hates the true Jesus Christ and the Bible. Even though he claims he's not a Muslim, he bends over backwards for Islam. Mm -hmm. Even though he says he's not a Muslim anymore. Became a Muslim, left, became a Muslim, left, became a Muslim, left again. All right. I want you, do me a favor, everybody. I want you to do me a favor, okay? Now it's too long. My goodness, all right. Let's see if I can shorten down. Okay. Click on that link. Click on that link, please. Click on that link. Tell me if it opens up. Okay. Tell me if it opens up. Click on it. Diana, please, sister, let's focus. Sister, please. Diana, please, let's focus. For May the Lord Jesus bless you, sister. But please, let's focus. Please. No fighting. Please, sister, you scare me. Diana, can I just say something? Okay, before we... I'm more scared of meeting you than I am a demon. Do you know why? I'm more scared of meeting you than a demon? Because a demon, I can rebuke him in the name of Jesus, so flee. You're a sister who loves Jesus. I can't rebuke you in the name of Jesus, so you ain't fleeing anywhere. So I'm more scared of you. Please, sister, please. Here, white flag. White flag, sister. Here. Here's the white flag. Here. Here. In fact, here. Will it make you happy if I if I bring a Catholic Bible? If I bring a Catholic Bible? See, a demon has to flee in the name of Jesus. You're a sister who loves the Lord. So even if I say, be gone in Jesus' name, you ain't going nowhere because you're a Christian. So I'll be stuck. No, oh, please. Okay, man. Please. Have mercy. Okay, let's focus, guys. Did you guys click on it? All right. Okay, click on it. All right, what did you see? Here's what you saw. When you clicked on it, you saw Paul Williams quoting this book. You saw Paul Williams quoting this book. Okay, and I read it. He's quoting it in context. He did not misquote it. In fact, because of his post, I went and checked. He quotes 
And it's there. He gives you the photos of the actual pages. He quotes their section on 2 Peter. I have it here and I read it. He's not misquoting. Pages 763 to 7. It looks like 64. Pages 763, 764. I have it here. I read it. You know what these two scholars say? You know what these two scholars say? You know what they say? Yep, speaker's corner. Evangelical scholars who are conservative or teaching in our evangelical institutions, they say the evidence against Peter writing 2 Peter is overwhelming. The evidence is too strong. Peter did not write 2 Peter. That's what they said. In fact, let me quote, postulating the apostle Peter as the author of this letter feels to us like pushing a big rock up a steep hill. The indications of post-Petrine, meaning that it's written after the time of Peter, after he died, authorship appear overwhelming. These are your scholars, folks. These are the scholars teaching your children about the Christian faith. There it is. Putting a weapon in the hands of those who hate the Bible, hate Jesus Christ, putting a weapon, it is, John, it is the consensus today, in the hands of those who hate Jesus to bludgeon us. Right here. You are safer to stay away from seminary, Bible college, Christian university. You are safer. In fact, I've even been told by Catholics, it's not liberal, Moses. See there? See, Moses thought it's liberal scholarship. No, 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 Moses. It's not liberal. It's an evangelical book written by two of the leading evangelical scholars who claim to be conservative and believe in Christianity, the Bible's inspired. N.T. Wright and Michael F. Byrd, neither of them believe the Bible's inerrant and believe the Bible has errors, and that Second Peter is a forgery, even though they won't say it. But when you say Peter didn't write it, even though the letter said Peter wrote it, this is it. I've even been told, I've even been told, That in certain high schools, Catholic high schools, the nuns there and some of the priests there teach liberal critical scholarship, destroying the faith of those students in the historical accuracy and preservation of the Bible. There you go. There you go. Right? So now... Guys, this is why, let me encourage you. Let me encourage you. Seek with all your heart the face of the Holy Spirit. Cry out from the depth of your being to the Holy Spirit. Beseech the Holy Spirit, please. I entrust my entire existence to you. I want to be in love with you and perfectly cling to you. I trust you. Save me. From these errors, from these individuals, and guide me to all truth, please. And pray that daily. Because you know why? Because the Holy Spirit is almighty. He's the almighty God, one with the Father and the Son. And guess what? In every age, he will raise up men and women, uncompromising, sold out, who doesn't care what the majority says, even if they get attacked and discredited, even if they don't get platforms to teach, who will preach with integrity the truth to the best of their ability by the power of the Holy Spirit. And they're there, and you'll find them. And my prayer is I can be one of them in Jesus' name if I'm not. That's what I've been praying, and that's what I continue to pray. That's why I keep progressing and changing, and I hope for the better, for the glory of Jesus. You do not. I'm going to repeat it again. Please. And I'm not saying this. I'm being honest. Lord, purify my motives honestly. You do not put your trust in any man. Please don't put your trust in me. Hear what I have to say. Go back and study it. Ask the Spirit to show you if I'm wrong. And if you're convinced I'm wrong, reject it. Pray the Lord will show me where I'm wrong and agree to disagree with me. I don't want people to parrot me. 
I don't want people to sound like me. I don't want people to speak like me. I want you to be you. And I want you to be like Jesus. And I want you to speak the way the Spirit wants you to speak. And may you give us the power to live for the glory of Christ. And I mean that from my heart, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Okay. With that said, you got that link. Now let me give you another link. Another link. People ask me about some of my views about <clears throat> Michael Eiser. Michael Eiser is a precious brother in Jesus. He's got some great views. But again, I don't agree with all his views. And that's to be expected. Because he's not infallible. I'm not infallible. Okay. Now, I have written a series of articles critiquing some of his points that I think were weak. Now, you may think I'm weak. He's, he's right. All right. And I'll have some more articles in the future. But here is the link. All you do is put Michael Heiser in the search engine and the series of articles I wrote critiquing some of his points that I thought were weak. <clears throat> You'll find there. Here's the link. I put it three times. Click on it. Read it. Come to your own conclusion. We'll have it in the description box. Okay. So now with that said, here's the article we're going to be focusing on today. Here is the article we're going to be focusing on today. The issue of hell and the fall of Satan, if you're okay, if you're up, alert, you're still focused and you still want to learn by the grace of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> you ready? Because I'm here to serve you, honestly. If you guys want me to come back tomorrow, I will. If you're ready, because here's the article then. If you're all on board, here you go. Here's the article. This is the article I'm going to be reading from. So first last doesn't even need to post. But what I want you to be reading from is not that article. Save the article, and I'm going to send Daydream this link. Daydream this link, because I don't know how to shorten it. Daydream, I'm going to. Do you have it from yesterday? Sleep, wake up, sleepy dream. I know what it means to. Uh, here you go. You got it now. I just sent it to you on Skype. Okay, guys, he's going to give you the link. Please click on it because you're going to read the Bible versions that I provided there. You're going to see how modern versions have impacted the church in some ways good, some ways very bad. And if you ask me my honest opinion, I've seen greater damage and harm by modern translations than good. That's just my opinion, and, and I'll explain to you why. Good has come out of it, but much bad as well. Okay, but now let's wait. I'm waiting for him to give you the link. Hold on, because you got to click on it. What does he want to call me about? Yeah. Sonny, don't call me right now, guys. Don't ask him to call me. You want me to do a su subject, right? If he calls me, I have to go off subject. Don't give these guys who want attention. Yeah, post it, Daydream. He, post it in the comment section. Don't, don't give these guys who are seeking attention, attention that we go off topic. That's a satanic trick. Brother, can you post it? Yeah, I'm going to close it now when he posts the link. Guys, he gave you the link. Click on it, please. Let me shut down Skype. Click on it, please. Guys, clicked on it. Post it. Daydream. You know it's not a sin if you post it once or more than once, right? Timmy? Timmy? He can post it more than once, Timmy. No, no, he can. Can you post the link more than once, Daydream? Post it at least two more times. I have articles showing that Peter wrote it. Don't worry about that now. Focus. Okay. He posted it a second time. Posted it, posted it a third time. Because we're just going to be reading verses. Now, click on the link, please. Click on the link, because as I read from the King James, you're going to be looking at those translations. First, last, and Protestant is going to have an easy day today. Okay, click on the link. Why are you doing this to me, Timmy? All right. Are you guys ready now? Let me explain what you're going to discover. Trust the Holy Spirit wants me to talk about these issues for the glory of Christ. And I hope Luis is here. Okay, Luis is here as well. Okay, what are you looking at? We're going to compare three English versions. Three English versions. Three. The authorized King James Version, the New International Version, the Dewey Reigns Version. Now let me explain why these versions. 
to this day, the authorized version and the new international version are the two best-selling English translations <clears throat> among English-speaking Christians. In the English-speaking world, the two best-selling English versions are the authorized version, thank you, Lord Jesus, praise you, Lord Jesus, that it's still the best-selling and most read. And I pray, Lord Jesus, you'll preserve this translation and never disappears. And the NIV, New International Version. And the NIV. Among English-speaking Christians, these are the two bestsellers. <clears throat> now, why did I also choose the Dewey Rames Version? Because the Dewey Rames, or Rhymes, Dewey Rames Version, is the English translation of the Latin Vulgate. Here I need you to pay attention. I need you to listen. The Latin Vulgate, produced by Jerome, became the official Bible of the Latin-speaking church for centuries. And then an English translation of the Latin Vulgate was made even before the King James. What you're reading is the Dewey Rames American edition, but the original edition was produced before the King James translation. So you know what's beautiful about the Dewey Rames? If any of you wanted to know what the Latin said, Dewey Rames is the English translation of the Latin. Even if you're not a Catholic, you should want to read it. Why? Because this is taken from the Latin translation. And you know why that's important? Does anyone know why it's important to know the Latin? Do you know we have more copies of the biblical books in Latin than we do in Hebrew of the Old Testament and the Greek of the New Testament? The New Testament books written in Greek, we have about 5,300 copies in Greek. And about with the Hebrew manuscripts, we have far less. Do you know we have nearly 10,000 copies of the books of the Bible in Latin? More than we have for the Greek, because the New Testament is in Greek. And yet, the copies of the New Testament... In Greek, are about 5,300, where it comes with Latin. The most manuscripts we have of the biblical books is in Latin. No. Where would you get the Greek was translated from Latin? No, it wasn't translated from Latin. It was translated, the Latin was translated from Greek and Hebrew. Jerome translated, produced his Latin Vulgate, the Vulgar, from the Greek copies he had in the Hebrew copies. Yeah, you kind of confused me there. Okay. So that's why even non-Catholics should read the Dewey Rames. And that's why Catholics should read the King James. <clears throat> Do you know why Catholics should be reading the King James? Do you know why? The King James for nearly 400 years was the unrivaled Bible translation for English-speaking Christians the world over. In fact, for over 300 years, it was the only... Or, there are others, the Geneva and all that, but it was the chief unrivaled Bible. Everyone read that. Testament. Do you know the beauty of Sheikh Google, Testament Faith? Sheikh Google has a search engine. It's called Sheikh Google. You click on it, Contradiction King James, and dozens of websites refuting those errors. I'm not the first one. It's been done before me and by people more equipped than me. So just go to Google Testament Faith and put in King James Bible Contradictions Refuted. It's there, friend. Thank the Lord for Sheikh Google, the greatest scholar, professor, monk that's never lived. The greatest scholar, professor, monk that's never lived. Takbir! Budweiser! Takbir! Nikolo! Takbir! Corona? Oh, no. No Corona. <laughs> All right. Okay, now with that said, now what are you going to see? Here's what you're going to see. Due to the rise of modern English translations, due to the rise of modern English translations, due to the proliferation of modern Bible versions, many of the doctrines that were hammered and preached passionately are slowly disappearing from English-speaking churches. Let me repeat. Please, I need your attention here. For the glory of Christ. Not because I need attention, but I want you to understand. 
Due to the proliferation, the rise of modern English translations, and the translation choices they make, many of the core doctrines of the Christian faith are slow, slowly disappearing from English-speaking Christians and churches the world over. Doctrines that used to be preached passionately, forcefully, before the rise of modern versions. Okay, now, my question for you. If you're not a Baptist that uses King James, listen to my question. Guys, please listen to my question. If you're not a Bible-believing Baptist who follows the King James, don't answer the question. This question is not for you. For every other English-speaking Christian who's not a Bible Baptist who only uses the King James, can you tell me the last time in your church you heard the man of God mention hell? Don't answer if you're a Bible-believing Baptist who follows the King James. Give me the last time you heard some, someone mention hell. A year ago, huh? Meaning the pastor. They call him the man of God. You want me to call him what? The donkey? Remy. Paul Washer is a Reformed Baptist. And being a diehard Calvinist, so preach the wrath of God. Ah, oh, Remy. Oh. Now, David, your pastor that mentions hell, what is he? Is he a Baptist? Does he follow King James? No, it's for the non-Baptists. I know Bible-believing Baptists that follow King James. They hear hell every time. I'm talking about those Christians who go to churches that don't follow the King James per se. How many times you hear about hell? I'm not talking about God's judgment. I'm talking about hell. Yeah, and you're talking about Reformed Calvinists who are passionate about the holiness of God. Yeah, amen. Praise the Lord. And those Pentecostal holiness churches, chances are they go with the King James, don't they, Candace? Many of them, if not all of them. Tristan, what's your church? Uh, you, I'm, I'm glad. What's your church? See, Candace, I was right, right? They go with the King James. Let me rephrase the question. If you're a church that uses the King James, don't answer the question. If you're a church that uses a Bible other than the King James... When's the last time you heard the man of God speak about hell or preach about hell? I, I'm sure you heard it, but when was the last time? Just curious. I'm just curious. And when you give me ESV, those are Calvinists. And Calvinists are all about the holiness of God and the wrath of God. So that, that's expected. Now, Titor, Tito Writer, your church, what is it? Praise God. You heard that daily mass. But prior to the daily mass, when did you hear it? Glory to God, Catholic. Glory to God. All right. What's my point? Here's what I want you to do from now on. Okay. Here's what I want you to do. Good. Here's what I want you to do. I want you from now on. See, it's Reformed Baptist. Yeah. You think I'm shocked? Reformed Baptist? Of course. Calvinist? Definitely. Reformed Baptist? Definitely. Very strong emphasis on the holiness of God and God's wrath. Very strong emphasis. That's why Paul Washer... Vody Bauckham, others will preach. That's why John MacArthur will preach. Exactly. Here's what I want you to do. I want you from now on, from now on, when you go to your church, I want you to count. I want you to count how many times hell will be mentioned throughout that year. Okay? If you go regularly or listen online regularly, it's only 52 sermons. Do me a favor for your own edification. Write down how many times hell comes up in the sermons. All right? Now, the reason why I say this is because Bible versions have impacted, whether good or bad, whether right or wrong. That's not what I'm here to say. Good or bad, right or wrong, impacted the church's view and passion about hell. I'm not even talking about the duration of hell. Is hell forever? Or do you go to hell and you're wiped out of existence? That's even a debate, believe it or not, among evangelicals. Two evangelicals, 50 opinions. The rise of modern Bibles have directly impacted the church's 
understanding and passion to preach about hell. And I'm not, it's true. And as we continue this trajectory, it's going to get less and less. I was going to say worse and worse, but I don't want to give, give away my position. Now, with that said, click on the link. We're going to talk about the word hell in the Old Testament. Are you ready? What you're going to do is you're going to take the article I gave you, open up your modern versions, and look throughout the Old Testament to see how many times the word hell, hell appears. Now, let me again preface this, a caveat. See, you just anticipated my objection, Daniel Babin. You see what Daniel Babin just said? Sam, can you answer why there is no mention hell or heaven in the Old Testament? You just anticipated the reason why I'm doing this session. Let me, let me, let me quote it. You see? Do you know why he thinks there's no mention of hell or heaven in the Old Testament? You see? Thank you. You're a godsend. You are a godsend. You know why you're a godsend? Because that's exactly my point. Daniel Babin, Sam, can you answer why there's no mention hell or heaven in the Old Testament? Thank you. That's exactly why I'm doing this session. You are a godsend, brother. Thank you. The Lord sent you because now I'm going to repeat the point. I'm going to preface this. What you're about to see is how versions will impact whether you find hell in the Old Testament or not. Whether you find hell in the Old Testament or not. So now the question is, which version accurately translated the Hebrew word? Should hell be in the Old Testament? Is it mentioned in the Old Testament? Or is this a mistake on the translators? And so modern versions correct that mistake and translate the Hebrew terms more accurately. Do you understand what is at stake now? Everyone with me? Okay, let me repeat so we can go into the meat. Does the word hell appear in the Old Testament? And do the Old Testament prophets speak about hell? Or is that an error on certain translations translating the Hebrew terms incorrectly because those Hebrew terms do not refer to hell? That's the debate. But now let's go into the data. You, you clicked on Bible Gateway, right? What you're going to do is, when I read a verse, you're going to look at the NIV and the Dewey Reigns. I'm going to read it from the King James. The link was given to you. Give it to them again daily if you can. Okay? Give them the link. Okay, click on it. Let's begin. Are we ready? Give me a one if we're ready. You're going to click on the link. You're going to read in the NIV Dewey Reigns. On that link, you're going to follow that link. I'm going to read King James from my article that I gave you. All right. You get it? All right. Let's begin. First verse on top. You make sure you read both NIV Dewey Reigns. Excuse me. Here I'm going to read. Deuteronomy 32, 22. For a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell. And shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Deuteronomy 32, 32. My anger will burn to the lowest hell. Not in the NIV. But it is in the Dewey Reigns version. In fact, Ariel, someone can confirm. Ariel, someone can confirm. The Latin is inferno. Inferno. The word for hell. Are we ready to move on to the second example? I have to include this in my paper. I don't know why I didn't include it. Hold on. Here's the second example. Hold on. One second. One second, guys. Okay, first Samuel two six. Sorry, no, no, no. Forget about Sir Samuel. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. That's why I didn't include it. My bad. Don't go to First Samuel two six. Forget it. Let's skip that. Go to the second example. Forget about that. Second Samuel twenty two verses five to six. Second Samuel twenty two verses five to six. King James. You look at NIV. It's all there. It's all there. For a fire. I'm sorry. When the ways of death compassed me, when the ways of death compassed me, when I was about to die. The floods of ungodly men made me afraid. 
The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. He was afraid that the sorrows of hell would consume him. 2 Samuel 22, right? Verses 5 to 6. I gave you, forget about 1 Samuel 2, 6. Now, do you see the word hell in uh, NIV? But you see it in the Dewey Rames, right? Notice King James, Dewey Rames agree. NIV and other modern versions disagree. Okay? Let's go to the third example. Let's go to the third example. Are we ready? Or perfect my sight. God bless you, Elisa. It will be recorded so you can watch it later. It's almost done. Let's go now to the third example. Job 11, 7 to 9. It's all there. Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty into perfection? It is as high as heaven. What canst thou do? Deeper than hell. What canst thou know? Deeper than hell. The measure thereof is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. It's not in the NIV, is it? You see it? You see the word inferi? Inferi. I believe that's the Latin for inferno hell, right? First and last. So you Catholics, your Dewey Rames agrees this is a reference to hell. No, I'm not posting the verse, Tristan. Did you not listen to the beginning? You're going to click on the link and read. So Catholics, your Dewey Rames agrees with the King James because the Latin word is inferni or inferi, meaning inferno, where we get inferno. Right? Everyone got it? Inferno. See, he just gave you the Latin first and last. Inferno. There it goes. The Latin says hell. You know what that means, Catholics? Catholics, you know what that means? It means Jerome understood these references to hell because when Jerome translated the Hebrew, when he translated into Latin, he translated as inferno. Jerome, a scholar of the highest eminence, a church father, he read the Hebrew and understood the Hebrew to mean hell. You got it now? So they can't tell you it's a modern understanding. This was the understanding of Jerome because the Latin Vulgate is based on what Jerome produced. The extent copies are copies of Jerome's Latin Vulgate. And in these places, it's the word for hell in Latin, inferno. Everyone with me there? Okay, let's go to the other example. Let's go to now Job 26.6. Job 26.6. Click on the link, read, Hell is naked before him, and destruction hath no covering. Hell is naked before him, and, destruct and destruction has no covering. Again, Dewey Rames agrees. I'm not saying they always agree. And NIV does not agree. And NIV is not alone. I'm not aware of any other modern version that translated as hell. We're all, we got a handful of examples. We're almost done. Right? Testament. I don't have much thoughts on ESV. Inferus. All right. Are we ready for the next example? We're going to try to speed it up a little bit. Now, Psalm 9, 16 to 17. Psalm 9, 16 to 17. The Lord is known by the judgment. Psalm 9, it's there. You don't even need to find it. Just go to your link and look at it at the NIV and Dewey Reigns. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Higayon, Selah. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Well, yeah, isn't that true according to New Testament? If you're wicked, you'll be turned into hell. Destruction. But how does the NIV render it? Hmm, let's see the NIV. NIV, how do you render it, friend? The wicked go down to the realm of the dead. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, I think with the with the Dewey Rames. Oh, that's why. I'm sorry. Dewey Rames, I guess the versification is different. 
So the Dewey Rames does will read the same, but because the numbering of the Psalms is different. So don't be don't be confused because here the Dewey Rames, I think it's Psalm 8, verses 16 and 17. Let me check real quickly. So, guys, because the Dewey Rames versification from the Psalms is different, it's gonna be different. Let me check something for me real quickly. I just noticed that. My apologies, guys. Yeah, because the Greek version and the Latin version go with a different chapter division of, of the Psalms, particularly the English translations. Let me see something. Let me confirm something for myself. Bear with me, guys. I think in the Latin would be Psalm 8. Let me check. I'm going to check it out. Yep. All right, let me see if I'm right. Let me see, bro. Hey, man, calm down, bro. Get off your horse. <laughs> All right, let me see. Let me see if I'm right. All right. Oops, uh, there's a mistake here. Hold on. Let me see. No, it's actually, oh, they gave me the NIV, sucker. Yep, I'm right. In the... Dewey Reigns, it's not Psalm 9, it's Psalm 8. It's not Psalm 16, it's Psalm 15. But it got it all messed up for me for a reason. Hold on. Sorry, guys, for the delay. Apologize for those who are watching later. Hold on, guys. Let me take care of something. What happened? Something messed up. Hold on. Why didn't it give me Psalm 8? Is there a reason why it didn't give me Psalm 8? Hmm. Let me try it again. Yeah, it won't give me Psalm 8. Hold on, guys. Let me see what's going on here. Apologize. See, that's what happens. Okay, Psalm 8. What was it? Psalm 8. Psalm 9, 16, 17, but here in the Dewey Rames. Dewey Rames, let's see, Psalm 8. Yeah, see, it's it's got a different... Division of the Psalm. So ignore Psalm 8 and the Dewey Rames. I apologize, guys. Now remember, in the Dewey Rames, if it's Psalm 16, it's Psalm 15. Psalm 16, it's going to be Psalm 15. So let me just pop up my Dewey Rames here. You guys stay on your links. Stay on your links. Hold on. Sorry about that, guys. See, technical difficulty. We can't even agree. All right. We were sailing along on a moonlight day. All right, guys. Hold on. So remember, Dewey Reigns, which I want you to see, it will be, if, it, if I'm reading Psalm 16, it will be Psalm 15. So go one chapter before. Okay. Let's do this. Okay, let me get rid of the international version. Okay, now let's continue. Are we ready? Are we ready? Psalm 16, 15, which in the Dewey Reigns is Psalm 15, 10. How does it read? Here it is. Because thou will not leave my soul in hell. That's Dewey Reigns. Thou will not leave my soul in hell. Now the next one, Psalm 18, is too long. It's too long. We're going to skip that. So skip that, Psalm 18. Go to Psalm 55, 15, which should be Psalm 54, 15 in the Dewey Reigns. Psalm 55, 15. Check the NIV. Let death seize upon them and let them go down quick into hell. For wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. Psalm 55, 15, King James, NIV doesn't say that. What does the Dewey Rames say? Okay. What does the Dewey Rames say? Because it'll be Psalm 54. Well, it doesn't even have Psalm 54. Say different versification, my goodness. All right. I can't find Psalm 54 in Dewey Rames. Okay. Let's go to now to the other one. Let's go to Psalm 86, 13. Psalm 86, 13. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. Psalm 86, 13, King James, you have delivered my soul from the lowest hell. You've saved me from going to hell. Does the Dewey Rames agree? Psalm 58, Psalm 85, 13 in the Dewey Rames. In the Dewey Rames, it's Psalm 85, 13. Here it is, folks. Psalm 85, 13. Here it is, Dewey Rames. For thy mercy is great towards me, and thou hast delivered my soul out of the lower hell. So the Dewey Rames is agreeing with the King James. Psalm 139, 7-8. We're almost done. Psalm 139, 
and everything will go back to normal. Psalm 139, 7 8, which in the Dewey Reigns is Psalm 138, 7 to 8. Psalm 139, 7 to 8. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. God, you are there, even if I go to hell. Does the Dewey Rames agree? Yep. Psalm 138, verse 8 of the Dewey Rames. Here you go. Here you go, guys. Here's the Dewey Rames. If I ascend into heaven, thou art there. If I descend into hell, thou art present. Did you catch it? So far, do you see Catholics and non-Catholics? How much do Dewey Rames agrees with the King James? And by the way, real quickly, it says God dwells in hell. Is that true or is that a wrong doctrine? Is God in hell or is he not in hell? Yes, he's in hell. Now, can I give you a New Testament verse to prove to you that God is in hell? Not that he's burning in hell, but he's in hell sustaining it and punishing the wicked in hell. Let me give you a New Testament verse. No matter what translation you read, it's there. It's Revelation 14, verse 10. Revelation 14, verse 10, but we're going to read verses 9 to 11. First last, if you can post. Revelation 14, verses 9 to 11, but it's verse 10. Revelation 14, verses 9 to 11. Here you go. Read with me. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man shall adore the beast and his image and receive his character in his forehead or in his hand, he also shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mingled with pure wine in the cup of his wrath, and shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the sight of all the angels and in the sight of the Lamb, or in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torments shall ascend up forever and ever, neither have they rest, day nor night, who have adored the beast, who have adored the beast and his image, and whoever receiveth the character of his name. Did you catch it? Because they're stupid, Emmanuel Perez. Satan does not rule hell. Everyone got it? So if I go with the King James and Dewey Rames, which is based on the Latin, even the Latin agrees, Psalm 139.8, it says that God is even in hell, so if you're in hell, you can't escape him. Did the NIV say that? Did the NIV agree? NIV agree? No, it didn't. Now, let's go back to the other verses. All right? Hold on. We got some more. Now, we're going to go into, into Proverbs. Now, Proverbs is pretty interesting. Proverbs is interesting for a reason. I'll show you why. Okay. Okay. You ready? Next one. Guys, focus, because I hope it's blessing you, shocking you, blowing you your mind away. The impact translations have. Proverbs 5, verse 5. King James. Compare it with your Dewey Reigns version. Now it's going to read uniform and NIV. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Ironically, it's talking about the adulterous woman, the immoral woman who entices men to commit adultery. Her feet will lead you and damn you to hell. Stay away from the adulterous woman. And women, stay away from the adulterous man. Adultery will damn you to hell. They're tools of the devil to damn you to hell. Okay, now question. Does the Dewey Rames agree with the King James that her steps lead to hell? Did you guys catch it? Dewey Rames agree with the King James, the adulterous, immoral woman and man will damn you to hell. But what does the NIV say? What does the NIV say? And other translations that follow the principles of NIV and translate it. Yep. Jerome was a scholar of biblical languages. He studied Hebrew, even with Jews. Jerome knew Hebrew and could translate Hebrew into Latin and knew Greek. He was a scholar. He was one of the leading biblical scholars. Okay, but now focus. Okay, now, Brother Bass, if you keep repeating yourself, we're going to block you. I want you guys to focus. Do you see... The King James and Dewey Rames agree that in these passages in the Old Testament, the inspired authors are referring to hell. 
Brother Bassett says you're repeating the same thing. So my brother, I love you. For the sake of the Lord, don't repeat the same thing. Unless it's answering my question because Catholic threw me out. says you're repeating the same thing. You're my brother in Christ. So if it's the same point, we got it. Okay, I'm sorry. Catholic, you need to repent for causing me to think that he's doing something. Anyway. Everyone got it so far? Okay, now let's continue. That's so why I wanted to. Why do you think I got attacked last night so viciously? Where last night I was going to do this session and I couldn't. Do you think it's a coincidence? Brethren, let's be honest and realistic. If we believe the Bible, then God is real, the spirit realm is real, demons are real, and they're impacting the physical earth and trying to keep us away from the true God. Do you think it was a coincidence last night? As I'm about to get into the subject, I get attacked and distracted by a, so a woman enticing a man to commit fornication. Good job, Avenger. Okay, now let's continue. Let's read. The next verse. We're almost done. I want to go into all these verses. Okay. Proverbs 7.27. Proverbs 7.27. Okay. Her house is the way to hell. Again, the immoral woman. And it's also, by extension, the immoral man. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Proverbs 7.27. This woman will lead you to hell. Does the Dewey Rames agree? Dewey Rames, do you agree? Yep. Dewey Rames. By the way, I'm, I'm looking at the Dewey Rames now myself. I looked at some, but not all, to prepare this. But what does NIV say? Hey, her ways lead you to the grave. Now, if you're an atheist, so who cares it leads me to the grave? I'm going to die anyway. But if as an atheist, you see the Old Testament says there's a hell, though you may deny its existence, at least you see it's taught in the Old Testament, right? Right? A couple more. Let's go. Proverbs 9.18. But he knoweth not that the dead are there and that her guests are in the depths of hell. This destroys soul sleep, by the way. If the dead are in hell, then the dead are alive. You understand how this passage destroys soul sleep? Proverbs 19. The dead are in hell. That means they're alive, they're conscious without their bodies, as souls, as spirits. This destroys soul sleep from the Old Testament. You caught it? Not if you read the NIV. Not if you read the NIV. But little do they know that the dead are there, that our guests are de deep in the realm of the dead. Now, that realm of the dead, other translations will say grave. No, it's not talking about believers here. It's not about unbelievers. Now, keep reading with me. Proverbs 15, verse 11 and 24. Proverbs 15, verse 11 and 24. Okay? Proverbs 15, verse 11 and 24. It's all there. Hell and destruction, Abaddon. Remember this passage. Hell and destruction, Abaddon, are before the Lord. How much more than the hearts of the children of men? Hell and destruction, Abaddon, are before the Lord. I'm going to blow you away with this verse. Get ready. How much more than the hearts of the children of men? Now, verse 24. The way of life is above to the wise, that he might depart from hell beneath. See, wisdom is with the wise in the Lord, and that wisdom will help you escape hell beneath you. So the Dewey Rames, hell, hmm. NIV, death and destruction, hmm. realm of the dead. Oh, interesting. <whistles> now, sadly, I missed the verse from the King James, Proverbs 27, 20, but I'll read in the Dewey Rames, Proverbs 27, 20. I will post it in my article. See, another one I missed. Hell and destruction are never filled. Hell and destruction are never filled. So the eyes of men are never satisfied. Hell and destruction are never filled. Let me see something. I didn't quote the King James here. There may be a reason. But let me just double check because I'm going to have to include it. To see why I didn't care. Yep. Proverbs 27, 20, King James. Hell and destruction never full. So the eyes of men are never satisfied. All righty then. Let's go. Next one. Are you ready? Are you ready for more? I hope you're not getting bored here, guys. We had close to 500. We're losing people. I hope it's because they had stuff to do. Isaiah 5, 13 to 16. Isaiah 5, 13 to 16. Read with me, folks. 
Therefore, Isaiah 5, 13, 16, it's all there, by the way. Therefore, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. Isaiah 5, 13, 16. And their honorable men are, are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst. Verse 14, therefore, hell hath enlarged herself. Do your aims agrees? Hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure and their glory and their multitude and their pomp. And he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. And the mean man shall be brought down. And the mighty man shall be humbled. And the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts, Yehovah of hosts, shall be exalted in judgment. And God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. Everyone got it? Luis, are you getting it? King James, Dewey Reigns, say that these words refer to hell. Not NIV and not other modern versions. Okay. Isaiah 14, verses 9 to 20, but we're not going to read all of it. Isaiah 14, verses 9 to 20, but we're not going to read all of it. We're just going to read Isaiah 14, verses 9 to 11. Isaiah 14, verses 9 to 11. Hell from beneath is moved for thee. Hell from beneath is moved for thee. Look at how the Dewey Rames renders it. Hell below is in an uproar to meet thee at thy coming. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stir, stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. Did you catch it, guys? Here's another powerful passage that says, In the realm of the dead, hell, there are others who have died and they're alive and conscious there. Did you catch it? Those mighty kings who are arrogant, wicked, sinners, immoral, idolaters, they're there waiting for you to join them. They're being punished. They're being damned there, and they're alive and conscious and waiting for you to join their company to be punished with them. It's Isaiah 14, verse 9, 11. Read it. That's what it said. I didn't make it up. Here, notice. Right? It stirreth up the dead for thee. Even all the chief ones of the earth, it hath raised them up from their thrones and all the kings and nations. And they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as us? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pop is brought down to the grave, meaning your body was buried. And the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread unto thee. Your body is now worm food, and the worms cover thee. Now notice that the Dewey Rames in verse 11 translates what the King James learned as grave. Dewey Rames translated as hell. Thy pride is brought down to hell. So the Dewey Rames actually translates the word grave in verse 11 of the King James as hell. Wow. Wow. Okay, let's continue. We got to go. I want to go through all the lists that I have in my article. Okay, let's continue. Isaiah 28, 14 and 22. Now, I'm not going to read all of it. I'm not going to read all of Isaiah 28, 14 and 22. It's long. You guys can read it at your own leisure. All right. You'll see the word hell appears twice in this section. And it appears twice. Let me see if it appears twice in the Dewey Rames. Okay. Let me see. All right. Yep, even in Dewey, Dewey Reims. In 15 and 18, it has hell. Wow. Let's just skip to 15. Isaiah 28, 15. Because you have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at agreement. Dewey, Dewey Reims agrees. When the overflowing skirt shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. For it made our lies our refuge, and, our, and under our falsehood have we hid ourselves. Now, verse 18. Dewey Reims and IV. I'm sorry. Dewey Reims, King James, comparison to NIV. I'm reading King James. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled, and your agreement with hell shall not stand. Again, Dewey Reigns, because the Latin says inferno, hell. King James, agree. This is a reference to hell, not the NIV or the modern versions. Not the NIV or the modern versions. They do not agree. Now, because I don't think all the verses, yep, let me see something. All right. Yep, it shows up. Ezekiel 31. Ezekiel 31. We're almost done. Let me see. Yeah. Let's skip because Ezekiel 31 is too long. And Ezekiel 32. You guys can read it at your own leisure in my article. 
We'll skip Ezekiel 31, Ezekiel 32. They're powerful, and I need to preach sermons on it. But let's just go to Amos. Amos chapter 9, verses 2 to 4. Do your aims, King James, NIV, and we'll end it there, and we'll talk about these issues. Okay. Amos 9, 2 to 4. I'll give you my article again. Though they dig into hell, thence shall mine hand take them. Though they dig into hell, then shall mine hand take them. Now, I'm going to give you another one that didn't show up here, but I'll give it to you now. Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. It didn't give it because it was too much in your link. Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, key verses 5. Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. See, you will live by your faith. Your faithful is trusting in God. Yea, also, because he transgresseth, transgresseth by wine. He sins by getting drunk. He's a proud man. Neither keepeth at home. He doesn't manage his house. He neglects his home. Who enlarges his desire as hell and is as death and cannot be satisfied. But gather unto him all nations and heapeth unto him all people. Now, again, what did you learn? Everyone with me? I hope I didn't put you to sleep. We're almost wrapping it up. We lost a lot of people. Hopefully, they'll come back. If not, I hope they didn't leave because they're disappointed or bored because I don't want to bore you. Do you understand the impact the translation can make? Did you remember what the brother asked me earlier? He asked me, why is it hell and heaven are not mentioned in the Old Testament? Depending on what translation you read. See, he's a godsend. Babin was a godsend. See what he asked? Why is it the Old Testament doesn't mention heaven, doesn't mention hell? Why doesn't it mention hell or heaven? Who told you it doesn't mention hell? Do you know why? Because of modern translations. Okay, Luisa, I don't know why you're not grasping it. Did you notice that the King James and the Dewey Rames translated specific Hebrew words as hell? So, Luisa, if you read the King James Bible, will you find a lot of references to hell in the Old Testament or no? Luisa, I want her to get it. Now, Luisa, if someone tells you, like Babin did me, why is it hell is never mentioned in the Old Testament? And if you follow the King James Version, where hell is mentioned repeatedly, what would you say to that person? What would you say in that, to, to that person? How come hell is not mentioned in the Old Testament? It, no, Luisa, not if you go with the NIV. Not if you go with the ESV. Not if you go with the RSV. The modern translations, the word hell never appears in the Old Testament. That's the point. You get it now? So now the debate is, did the King James, Latin Vulgate, Dewey Range translation get it right? Were they right for translating the Hebrew terms as hell in the Old Testament? Or were they wrong and modern versions are right? See, that's the debate. But you know what? Whatever side of the debate you land on, it does impact your doctrine. Because notice what Babin asked. He's a godsend. Guys, the Lord sent him. Do you know why? If you follow King James, Dewey Rames, or Latin Vulgate, you can tell Babin, yes, hell is mentioned all over the Old Testament. What are you talking about here? Deuteronomy, prop. But if you follow NIV, ESV, RSV, NRSV, New American Standard Bible, NASV, the answer is no, hell doesn't appear. It does not appear in the Old Testament. So then you're going to have to answer, why is it mentioned in the Old Testament? How come it's only mentioned in the New Testament? You understand now the point? Notice what I didn't tell you. I'm going to be clear so that people don't misquote me. I didn't say modern versions are wrong. I didn't say they're right. I said it is an issue. Now, they are translating the same Hebrew manuscripts. It's the same Hebrew manuscripts, same Hebrew words. NIV, all modern versions, are translating the same Hebrew words. It's not a different text. It's the same Hebrew manuscripts. These verses are in the manuscripts that all these translations use to translate from. The question is, who's translating these terms correctly? 
Did the King James translators translate it correctly as hell? Did the Latin translation of Jerome translate the Hebrew correctly as inferno, meaning hell, thereby giving us the Dewey Reigns, which translates Latin into English and translates those words as hell, or were they wrong? Whatever side of the debate you land, whatever answer, answer you give, it will affect your doctrine of hell. It will. I'm not saying it will be eradicated, but it won't have as much support and it will have nil support from the Old Testament. Because if Babin asks you, and you read the NIV, how come hell is not mentioned in the Old Testament? Your answer is, I don't know. God didn't reveal it. But if you're reading King James, you'll say, what are you talking about, man? Hell is all over my Old Testament. Look at how many times my Old Testament has hell. If you are a Catholic who follows the Latin Vulgate or Dewey Reigns translation of Latin Vulgate, you'll answer the same way. What are you talking about, Babin? It's all over the Old Testament. It's in my Old Testament. Here, look, hell, 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 hell. Not if you follow modern versions. Let me give you my article again. Here it is. So can I ask you a question? Even though King James is archaic, Dewey Reigns is archaic, but I want to, your feedback, and I don't want my view to be your view. I want your view to be the Holy Spirit's view. I want you to adopt the thinking of the Holy Spirit, and I pray that for myself. Okay, now, well, Louisa, guess who translated the Latin Vulgate? Louisa. Louisa, guess who translated Latin Vulgate? It was done in the 5th century, 400s, by Jerome. Jerome, even those who are not Catholic, even James White. See, Daniel Babin, you're here. Now, Daniel Babin, real quickly before I make that point. Do you see how hell is all over the Old Testament if you read the Latin Vulgate, the Dewey Reigns, and the King James? And by the way, all the English translations leading up to the King James, whether the Geneva Bible, Wycliffe, all of them read hell. As far as I'm aware, Lord Jesus, save me if I'm mistaken. Forgive me if I'm mistaken. But if I am recalling correctly, if you read the English versions leading up to the King James, they too read hell. So now, Babin, in answer to your question, did you get a yes from the King James? Yes from the Latin Vulgate? Yes from the Dewey Reigns? Hell is mentioned in the Old Testament? No, it's okay. However you want to answer, John Eppett. I'm just saying, if you take these translations, you don't have to say that hell was a later revelation. John Eppett, you understand? If you go by these translations... You don't have to say that hell was a later revelation, not known in the Old Testament period. You'll say they knew it from the beginning and spoke of it by revelation of the Holy Spirit. Now, Louisa, for you, to make a point, for you. Jerome was one of the greatest Bible scholars who knew biblical languages. Even James White will admit this. He knew Hebrew. He read Hebrew. He knew Greek, read in Greek. And he translated the Old Testament from Hebrew into Latin. And he translated the Greek New Testament into Latin. He's the one responsible for translating these Hebrew words as inferno, meaning hell. So now, Jerome, here's one of the greatest early church scholars, one of the most brilliant church fathers that ever lived. And he understood these terms to be hell. Is he wrong? Maybe. Maybe he's wrong. Maybe. Right? So I'm not deciding it for you. There's my link. What I want you to do is now prayerfully seek the face of the Holy Spirit and ask the Holy Spirit to show you what is truth and what you should expect. And pray that for me. So I'm not deciding it for you. I'm just giving you the facts. But let me ask you a question, because we got some talk, something to talk about uh, of Satan in a minute. I don't know, David. Could you check? David Wooten, can you check those verses? Like, go to the New King James, Deuteronomy 32, 30, uh, 32, 22. Okay, now. Okay, now, let me ask you a question. In light of the proliferation of modern Bibles, some great blessings and advantages. If you can't read archaic English, these modern versions do help. 
and smoothing out the text. But let's be honest. Has the evil, the damage, the bad that these modern translations caused outweigh the good and the benefit? Have they produced more good than bad? Or have they produced greater disunity, chaos, division than good? Answer that for yourself. Answer that for yourself. No, Luisa, don't misunderstand. The saints came out of that compartment of hell where it wasn't torment. It was Abraham's bosom, Luisa. They were not being tortured in hell. See, this is where you get confused. It can still be called hell. Why? Not because they were tormented like Abraham and Lazarus. It's because it's still hell in that they're still not in the presence of God, meaning the visible presence of God, like the angels are. So now for a believer, is that not hell? Louisa? Hell for a believer is not fire. Hell for the believer is devoid of the loving, visible presence of our God. Can you imagine, Louisa, if I say, you will live on earth forever, but you'll never see Jesus visibly. You'll never see his human face. You'll never kiss his physical hands. You'll never be hugged by his physical body. And you'll never see God the Father visibly or the Holy Spirit. That is the believer's hell. So in one sense, Abraham and the righteous saints were in hell, though not tormented, not tortured by fire. Because Jesus' parable of Abraham and, the, and Lazarus, they were in peace, they were rest, but it was still hell for them in that they ached to be in the visible presence of God, seeing God visibly, beholding him visibly in his glory, like they did often while on earth. You see, Louisa? I would rather have a translation that says they were in hell and explain it than a translation that doesn't say hell and rob me of all of these Old Testament citations proving that hell was known. So in the translations of the King James and Dewey Rames, hell is used in a more broader sense. Louisa, let me help educate every one of you. Hell was used in a more broader sense to refer not just to Gehenna, where an unbeliever would be damned with his body and his soul. It was also used to refer to Sheol or Hades, Hades. And there, the unbelievers were being tormented without their physical bodies as souls and spirits. But also, you had the souls and the spirits of the righteous. They were in, quote-unquote, hell, but not tormented, not tortured. Clear? Did I help you, Louisa? So I hope you're not confused, sister. Help me out because I want to make sure you're blessed and not confused. You're not confused? Yes, it is, Tristan. It's an actual scenario of actual persons who are actually alive in the netherworld. Okay, glory to Jesus. You bless my heart, Louisa. So now let me ask you a question because I want to talk about two things, wrap it up. I may come back on tonight again. Maybe not because Lisa's going to be sleeping, but not. I will do a session answering question about Satan's judgment because I don't know how much time I have. But I want to ask you guys a question. Would you rather have a Bible that translates these words as hell in the Old Testament and explain what hell means and doesn't mean when it comes to the fight, fate of the righteous saints who went there Explain they weren't tormented, tortured. They were still in peace, but it was still a form of hell for them. Or would you rather have a Bible that never uses the word hell so that someone like Daniel Babin, our brother, can ask me, how come hell is never mentioned in the Old Testament, Sam?
It is Solus Christus. Let me give you my honest opinion from someone who's on the other side. This pushback against the King James Version is a satanic spiritual attack of Satan using even gullible Christians who love the Lord unbeknownst to themselves, thinking they're honoring God by attacking it. Okay, now, let me now show you something beautiful that you're going to miss from modern versions, okay? Let me just double check something real quick. Let me check some, double check something real quick. All right, let me see. Do me a favor. First and last. Pro, post Proverbs 15, 11, King James Version, and then 27, 20. But let me double check something. Double check something. I'm going to blow you away. You guys want to get blown away? You guys want to get blown away? All right, let me check something. Okay, beautiful. It is. All right. Proverbs 15, 11 and 27, 20. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more than the hearts of the children of men? Guys. Get ready to be blown away how the New Testament confirms the Old Testament and how miraculously consistent it is. Leave this to everyone else. Get ready to be blown away. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more than the hearts of the children of men? Now, to verse 20. Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of men are never satisfied. We know what the word hell is. It's show. You know what the word for destruction is in both places? I want to blow you guys away. Oops. Sorry. I gave you the wrong link. I want to blow you away. Guys, can you do me a favor? Click on this link, Abaddon. Yep, Abaddon. You don't need to read Hebrew. Thank you, Credo. God bless you, Catholic, my brother. Click on it. The word destruction is Abaddon. 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 I pronounce it Abaddon. Okay, can you guys confirm it? Proverbs 27, 20, the word destruction is Abaddon or Abaddon. You know, however you want to pronounce it. The same thing in Proverbs 15, 11, because I want to show you something. Proverbs 15, 11. Get ready to be blown away. <laughs> yep. Abaddon. 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 Does everyone see it's Abaddon? Now, here's the Hebrew for Proverbs 15, 11. Does everyone see it's Abaddon? You see it? Abaddon, right? Do you know why that's mind-blowing? Do you want proof that our Bible is supernatural, divine in origin, inspired by the same God? Let me show you who Abaddon is. Let me show you who Abaddon is. Revelation 9, verse 11. Revelation 9, verse 11. Louisa, get ready. Revelation 9, verse 11. Here you go. And they had a king over them, the king of the abyss, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Abaddon is a spirit creature given authority over hell. <laughs> Revelation 9, 11 again. Revelation 9, 11 again. Who is Abaddon? Who is Abaddon? And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon. That's the word, Proverbs 15, 11, Proverbs 27, 20. When it says hell and Abaddon, destruction never satisfying or before God, the author, by inspiration, was referring to this spirit creature whom God assigned to rule over hell, Sheol, the bottomless pit, and he stands under the watchful eye of God. Abad. But in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Catholic, that's very difficult. I still have been raised on hell being eternal, but I'll be honest with you, Catholic. Let me be honest. The other side, their argument for annihilationism, that people go to hell for a period of time and wipe out extin extinction, they have very strong exegetical arguments, not emotional, exegetical. And I'm wrestling with that, and I'm not the only one. Even someone like Michael Brown came out saying the same thing, which intrigued me, because he holds the same position I do. 
He embraces Catholics, Orthodox, Syrian Church of these Coptics as true believers born of the Spirit who love Jesus. And he also says that annihilationism has some strong evidence. It's interesting, right? But anyway, did you guys learn a lot today? Learn a lot. Yeah, he's good on that too. Is Dave? No, Abaddon is not the devil. Abaddon is not the devil. No, R. No, no, no. Abaddon is not the devil. He is the angel who will chain the devil and throw him into the abyss. Okay? Let me show you that. Revelation 9, 10 to 11. Someone who denies the Trinity. Revelation 9, 10 to 11. And they had talks, tales like unto scorpions. These are the demons that came out. And there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. Okay? Now watch this. And they had a king over them, these demons, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Now look at Revelation 9.1, who this angel is. Revelation 9.1. Daniel, how can it be true if hell is mentioned all over the Old Testament, even before the Babylonian captivity when they came under Persian influence? Revelation 9, 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. So this star is that angel of the bottomless pit who's Abaddon Apollyon. Are you getting it? Abaddon Apollyon. That's that star, that angel that came down with the key over the bottomless pit, right? You got it? Okay. Revelation 20, verses 1 to 2. Revelation 20, verses 1 to 2. Yeah, different from Satan, Brandon. He's not Satan. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit. Who is that? That's Abaddon, Apollyon of Revelation 9. Don't forget, make the connection. Having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Where did you get that? It's Satan. It's not. Exactly belongs to Christ. You answered it. You answered it. Belongs to Christ. Now, guys, you want me to really blow you away? Do you really want to get blown away? Louisa, you want to be blown away and shocked and freak out where you're going to be so hyped tonight you can't sleep. You're going to be so in awe of the Bible and the God of the Bible and the Word of God, knowing how real he is. You're going to say, no way, you can't sleep tonight. You ready? You guys ready? The word, bottomless pit. Revelation 9.1. In the Greek is abuso. Abuso. Revelation 9.1. Andre Anderson. It's the same Greek word, Anderson Bong, but they translate it differently. Revelation 9, 1, and the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. To him was given the key of the bottomless pit. The word bottomless pit is abuso, abuso, the abyss. Bottomless pit, the abyss. Everyone with me there? When the demoniacs saw Jesus, when the demons who possessed that man saw Jesus, go to Luke 8, 31. Truth sets you free. I know you still want me to marry you. Calm down, sister. I'm here. Calm down. So, like, she's trying to get my attention. Look, damn. Blow us away. Love you, gorgeous beast. All right. Anyway, Luke 8, 31. Pay attention. And they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. Guess what the word deep is, guys? Guess what the word deep is? Abuso. The abyss, the bottomless pit. It's the same Greek word. So the demons were afraid, right? They got afraid saying, please, don't send us to the abyss, the bottomless pit. We're afraid, Lord Jesus, you're going to send us there. We don't want to go there. That's why when you read Revelation 9, it says when the angel opened up the shaft of the abyss, demons came out because the demons are chained there and tormented. And these demons, the demoniacs, didn't want to go there. Now, guys, get ready to be blown away. Get ready to be blown away. The Greek word is the same. It's abyss, abuso. It's the same Greek word. You know where Jesus went for those three days? No, it's not so much went there early, Luis. There are already demons there constrained and are tormented. So they're afraid they'd be sent there 
constrained, tormented, not free to roam the earth until the day of judgment. You with me there, Luisa? Already there are demons who are constrained there and tormented. That's why, Luisa, if you read Revelation 9, it says, when the angel came down, he opened up the shaft of the abyss and released demons. And those demons were sent to torment, torture mankind for five months. Right? So there are already demons there, tormented and chained, waiting the day of judgment. They were afraid that Jesus would send them there and constrain them there so they wouldn't be free to roam the earth. You get it now, Louisa? Is the Bible amazing or what? Is the Bible amazing or what? But it's going to get more amazing. Guys, do you know where Jesus was for three days? Do you know where he was for three days? Yes, Michael, it would include them. It would include them, Michael Stark. He was in the abyss. Jesus went to the abyss, the bottomless pit, for three days. Romans 10, 6 to 7. Romans 10, verses 6 to 7. Jesus went to the bottomless pit, the abyss. He was there for three days. Romans 10, 6 to 7. Here you go, guys. Read it. Read it. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend to heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above, to bring him down from heaven. Now watch verse 7 and be blown away. Who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. Did you catch it? Jesus, when he died, went to the deep, the abyss, the bottomless pit, and rose out of it on the third day. And Tristan, you resolved the contradiction you just created for not understanding the Bible. You created a contradiction, you resolve it. I know how to answer, but I won't answer it for you. Romans 10, 6 to 7. Read it again. And if you want, I'll give you the Greek link to see the Greek or first last can post it. But the righteousness, which is of faith, speaketh on this wise, say not in thy heart who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, down from above. Well, he did come down from heaven. That's true. But now read verse 7. Or who shall descend into the deep? The Greek word is abyss. He just posted it. Right? Abusun, the accusative. Can you just post that word itself? The deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. There it is. Jesus went to the bottomless pit, the abyss, to Hades, Sheol, hell, not Gehenna, didn't exist, for three days and came out of it on the third day. Blown away. Mind blown. Why do you think in the Apostles' Creed, let's recite it. Oh, you, see, Tristan, you beat me to it. I love you, brother or sister. I don't know if you're a sister. Tristan, in the next session, I'll reconcile what it meant when Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Okay. Let me recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. Greek word, Hades, Hades. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he shall come to judge the living and dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the, resur the resurrection of the dead, and the life everlasting. Amen. But he did not go there. He did not go there to be tormented, to be tortured, to be burned by flames. That is blasphemy. He did not go there to be tortured, to be tormented, to, to be burned by flames. He went there proclaiming his victory that now by my cross, I have crushed and conquered the kingdom of darkness, and I have power over the abyss, over Hades, over hell, over the grave. Revelation 1, 17, 18. Revelation 1, 17, 18. He went there as victor. 
He went there to show his victory. I have come. And you, Abraham, and all my Old Testament saints and friends who've been waiting here, not tortured, not tormented, not in pain, but waiting to enter God's heavenly presence, I've come to take you home. Let's go home. For the rest of you, you have been defeated. You're lost. Because the king has come and triumphed. Revelation 1, 17 to 18. Exactly. Disarm the spiritual rulers and authorities. So let's Christos. Revelation 1, 17, 18. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and last. Notice 18. I am the first and last. I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. The keys of hell and death are in my hand. Because by my death, I have destroyed the grave, death, and I've destroyed the netherworld. And there in my hand. Relation 118, one more time. Relation 118, one more time, and we're done. And we're done. I am he that liveth and was dead. I was dead. So it's Jesus. I was dead. Behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. There you go, folks. Tell me you guys are not mind blown. Yes, Joyce Meyer and others believe, unfortunately, God forbid such blasphemy. Jesus went to hell and was tormented and had to be born again in hell. Blasphemous, if you ask me. False. But guess who else believes it? Guess who else believes it? Stephen Anderson, Pastor Stephen Anderson of Faithful Word Baptist Church. He believes Jesus went to hell and was tortured there as a burnt offering. Yep. Anyway, guys, I'm tired. I hope you're blessed. Don't forget tomorrow. Tomorrow, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Guess who's coming on? And it's already on my YouTube channel. You cannot miss this session. I want to see 1,000 people. God willing, if the Lord wills. Tomorrow, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. James E. Snap is going to do a full presentation refuting... The errors, the distortions, the misinformation of James White. James White had a debate with brother Jeff Riddle on whether Mark 16 verses 9 to 20 was authentic. And let me be, be very honest with you. James White's debate tactics have become disgusting for me. And this comes from someone who's harsh and cruel and will call blasphemers, arrogant jerks. I'll call them dogs. Jeff Riddle did an amazing job of providing the overwhelming evidence showing that Mark 16 verses 9 to 20, authentic. James White was reduced to attacking straw man, smoke and mirrors tricks, red herrings, and not dealing accurately with the textual data and ignoring many of the main objections and went on a rant attacking Jeff Riddle for holding to the King James and the received text as the perfectly preserved words of God, spent more time in trying to discredit him so that people would see that he's a joke and not a scholar. And yet Jeff Riddle was excellent. And in the next debate that they did, Ephesians 3.9, honestly, I thought Jeff Riddle was going to do bad. Ephesians 3.9, the reading of the King James, I thought he's going to do bad. I was impressed with how good he did. And I saw James White attack him, throw out red herrings, Smoke and mirrors, talk down to him, and on top of that, fail to understand the implication of his arguments and showed he's inconsistent. If you want to see why I say that, go to the second debate. I posted some comments exposing James White. I'm sorry to say, as much as I want to love this brother, he is no longer effective in my view. I'm being honest. He is now doing more damage than good, and he's much dangerous, and his pride has gotten to him. He's blinded to his inconsistency and arrogance and how he does more damage than good. So God willing, tomorrow, James Knapp will be on decimating the misinformation of James White on Mark 16, verse 9, 10, 9 to 20. And folks, can I ask you a question? Mark 16, verses 9 to 20, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, New York Time. Can I ask you a question? Why did James White debate Jeff Riddle? And why does he refuse to debate James Knapp when James Knapp is a bona fide scholar of the New Testament textual tradition? And even James White has admitted 
He's a scholar, knows his stuff. And James, James Snap is not King James only, received texts, but he just examines the manuscripts and will go with what the evidence points him to. Why doesn't he debate him? He even said, uh, I'd rather debate him on John 6 and his view of salvation. And why did James White tell Stephen Boyce, one of his cronies, not to debate James Snap? Why are they debating folks like Jeff Riddle when Jeff Riddle said in the beginning, I'm not an apologist, I'm not a debater. He says it. I'm a pastor who pastors the G Church of Jesus Christ and loves the Word of God. Amen to you. Why then don't you debate James Knapp? Because why? James White has become an intellectual bully, bullying people that he thinks he can expose, but he won't dare debate people who know. Because when he does, he gets exposed. Watch his debate. Watch his debate with Robert Spencer. He got schooled. In that debate, Robert Spencer exposed him for being in it when it came to Islam. See, the folks that know their fields, he won't touch them. But he'll go after people that he can bully. And what do we do? By the power of Jesus Christ, we are bully destroyers in Jesus' name. So tomorrow, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, New York time, you got to listen. James White putting holes in James White's narrative. Holes in James White's narrative. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus is Almighty God, the eternal Son of the Father, eternal companion of the Spirit, one with them. And all three persons of the Godhead are worthy of our love, worship, devotion. We live for them and die for them. Lord Jesus, wash us in your blood. Wash our loved ones, my daughters, in your blood. Give us the power of the Holy Spirit to love you and obey you and fear you and glorify you and please you. Delight your heart. And if we must die for you. And the health we need to serve you and the provisions, Lord. Save us from Satan and these attacks. And keep us in love with you until you call us home and until you return. When you return sooner than later, we ache for you, Son of God. We don't ache for you enough. May we ache for you more to see your face. Kiss your physical face. Kiss your physical hands. Kiss your physical feet. And have your beautiful physical arms embrace us. And to hear from your blessed mouth, <clears throat> hear from your blessed mouth when we see your physical human eyes, looking at your physical eyes and your, your human mouth, your human face, radiating with the divine glory as you look at us and you say, I love you. I'm in love with you. And now you are in my arms forever and ever. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Take care.